This is Criteria. everybody, welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miras, here with my co-host James Mievsky. Hello, James. Hello, Thomas. We are here to discuss season four of The Chosen. We've reviewed every season thus far, and uh, I will mention actually uh, up front that by the time this episode's co- episode comes out, I will have published uh, an article taking a look at Angel Studios as a whole, uh, who, of course, The Chosen started out with, although this new season uh, was not uh, connected with Angel Studios since they've parted ways after season three. Uh, so I'll link to that article in the show notes for anybody who's interested in my my views on this sort of broader development in Christian filmmaking. Um, but let me introduce our guests. We have two guests today. Usually we just have one. We've got two. And uh, first is our, our usual guest for our Chosen episodes. Uh, brother Joshua Vargas is... Uh, a brother and seminarian in the Philadelphia Oratory. Welcome back, Brother Josh. Thanks. Great to be here. Brother Josh, what's your current status? Where are you in your trajectory right now? Uh, Well, I'm now in my third year of theology, so currently preparing to be, uh, God willing, ordained to the diaconate, and uh, otherwise just working at the oratory, teaching Christian initiation here, teaching in our school, our pre-K through A school, and... um, helping to with all the other ministries we have at the moment. And, and you're still doing some visual art, right? Um, I haven't done any personal projects in a while. I'm currently painting a mural in our school. Um, and uh, that's that's ongoing. <laughs> it needs to be done this weekend. So hopefully it will finish it quickly. Excellent. Excellent. What's what's the mural of, if I may ask? The mural is actually the design of Brother Alexander in our community, who is spearheading a renovation of the foyer of the school. Um, so it features, um, it's all kind of stylized, but it features the church uh, in kind of high perspective. And then um, part, or, yeah, the uh, the uh, main spire of the church, the school in front of it, the school is the most prominent thing. Um, and then the art museum to the side, because we're right near the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then you can see some of the skyline and some foliage and the St. Joan of Arc statue and a few other little things here and there. And it'll have a banner saying St. Francis Xavier School. Excellent. Oh, that's exciting. Um, and of course, you have uh, a degree in, in film from Tisch. And mm. uh, we've got another uh, filmmaker with us today who has not discussed The Chosen with us before, but is joining us after I battered him for, I think, years to watch this so that he could come and, and join us and, and get his take on the podcast. So uh, Nathan will be giving us a fresh perspective on the show. Uh, Nathan Douglas, of course, who is our, our frequent guest co-host on Criteria. So welcome back, Nathan. Thanks. Thanks, guys. It's, it's great to be here. And I will say uh, I've highly enjoyed listening to the, the shows and episodes that three of you have done in the past. So I'm going to take the uh, longtime listener, first time caller position here. And I <laughs> couldn't be more excited. All right. Well, you're also going to be the first time speaker because I'm going to, since you haven't been on this podcast with us discussing The Chosen before, uh, I wanted to ask you, Nathan, uh, for, you know, some quick thoughts on the show as a whole up to up to now, because we haven't gotten your 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 thoughts on like the first three seasons, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. So um, it's pretty fresh for me. I had held off on watching the show entirely until two months ago. So I spent uh, most of June just watching The Chosen and little else uh, from the get- from season one all the way through actually to the end of season four. So I did all four seasons in, in one run in about three weeks. Um, and then for prepping for the show, I've gone back and rewatched parts of season four to, to prepare. Um, but uh, yeah, my overall thoughts on The Chosen... Um, I guess just as a a tiny preamble, um, you know, it's the kind of show that obviously as, as both a Catholic and as a filmmaker, uh, you know, it's always kind of coming up and people are always kind of talking about it and saying, Hey, have you watched the chosen? Have you watched the chosen? And, you know, especially after uh, 2020, that was kind of the case. It was everywhere. Um, and I didn't put off watching it kind of out of any, um, conscious resistance. Uh, I was always curious about the show, but it was kind of always something that I was kind of, you know, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. Well, as with a lot of these things, when, you know, you, you finally get around to it, my experience of the show was, wow, you know, I wish I hadn't waited so long. This is, this is really good. Um, so my overall feelings on the show, especially seasons one to three, uh, are just incredibly, uh, overall very positive. Um, 
Um, my favorite things about it, I'll just list a couple of things. Obviously, everyone everyone talks about Jonathan Rumi's performance as Jesus, and you know, it's it's everything that people say it is and more. It really is one of the most, I, I would say, extraordinary um, kind of like roles that that we have going right now, kind of in in any narrative, <clears throat> you know, project. Um, the sense of presence that he brings, the 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 depth and and you know the the sense of it never being a forced thing. You know, with a lot of television shows, you can often see the seams of acting, even of <clears throat> excuse me, of even good performances. Like I would throw out as example something that I think we're all familiar with. You know, Breaking Bad, um, justly praised for a lot of reasons, but uh, personally, I, I have difficulties with the lead performance of that show. Um, Brian Cranston as, as Walter White, an incredible actor, an incredibly skilled actor who is, you can kind of always see the, the aspects or you can kind of see the seams of the performance. You can kind of see the craft, you know, it's, it's not so much a lived in kind of organic thing. It's, it's a very much a, a constructed thing. And so one of my favorite things about the chosen is that, you know, even though Jonathan Rumi is for sure, like any actor, he's crafting, he's constructing, there's a real sense of lived in that you, you don't see the seams, I guess, is maybe the easier way of putting it. Um, and on top of that, the the sense of encounter with the person of Christ, you know, that they're bringing through the show, I think is very profound, incredibly moving. Easily the most powerful thing about it is just to have the, the show providing these opportunities to kind of just hang out with, you know, with the Lord. In, in this sense. And I think that's, that's the best thing about it. Um, one other thing I'll mention that I really love about the show is there's a real sense of formal play as uh, from a filmmaking point of view, there's a, there's a real, um, you can really feel Dallas Jenkins, you know, uh, who is, you know, directing the entire show as, as kind of, as the single director of every episode. Uh, you really see a continuity of the growth and confidence in how they're tackling the material, how they're staging things. Um, but then also really getting to the form of, you know, all these, different little stories that that are part of the journey um trying different ways of expressing that you know in season two you really kind of see the show explode in this way um where you see all these you know they're they're doing the the there's the you know the 14 minute single take in one episode that you know has its it's good sides and it's bad sides, but it's an incredibly confident, incredibly, you know, kind of risky thing. And I, I love seeing that daring. Um, in the same season you have uh, in episode four, there's this uh, basically like a silent film montage of the whole lead up to the backstory of Simon the Zealot, which is just, uh, I think if I had to pick a single kind of like capsule of the chosen at its best as purely as like film craft, I would maybe choose that, um, that section. It's just, it's basically just a, uh, an incredibly expressive short film in its own right. So I love that uh, you see the, the, yeah, the play, like they're playing, they're playing, they're trying new things. They're not, they're not trying to stay in a static mode for the most part that you would expect with uh, narrative television. And uh, I think that's, that's totally to be applauded. One last thing I'll mention, and this is maybe more of a, a criticism, and I, I think we'll kind of get into it more as we, as we talk today about season four. Um, my overall maybe, uh, Less positive thought about the show is that I do think it is it has a tendency to over literalize um, many things that don't need to be literalized. Uh, it has you know one of the great strengths is that it, it really lets you sit in these powerful moments with the characters, uh, but then sometimes it'll turn around and it'll it'll add all this kind of text and dialogue into the mouths uh, where you can sort of feel the writers trying to explain everything through this expositional way of, of handling scenes that even in scripture, you know, if there, there are many, <clears throat> many occasions where if you just take the scriptural scene um, and just kind of let it play as drama, you don't, you know, it, it hangs on its own. You know, there's not, sometimes there's cases where it helps to fill in the gaps and sometimes though it really doesn't. And so I think the show, the showmakers have a tendency to try to fill in those gaps, even when they'd be better off, letting things be silent or, or have, you know, this, this space for reflection. Um, but all that aside, you know, I'm in for the long run. I'm really excited to see where they go. And I think they are doing, you know, something extraordinary, obviously as a whole project. Um, and with, again, with, with Jonathan Rumi's work, um, I'm just incredibly excited to see kind of where this goes all the way to the end.
Great. Yeah. Thanks for that, Nathan. Um, so uh, those those are your overall thoughts. We've, we're now up to speed. Season four. Yeah. And uh, it's cool because I, I haven't gone back and listened to our previous discussions of seasons one through three. But listening to you now, Nathan, I'm reminded of a lot of the the remarks that we made, you know, you know, not just on Jonathan Rumi's performance, obviously, but on this uh, playfulness, um, especially in season one, I, I felt like there were a lot of moments that felt, you know, almost experimental, you know, in, in, in their bent. And, uh, you know, not to, to lead things off with a criticism, but... But just thinking on this now, I'm I'm aware of how much I felt like that was lacking in this most recent season. Um, Nathan, since you watched all of them together uh, more recently than I did, d- do you see there being a shift in season four, specifically with reference to this playfulness that you're referring to? There, yes, there are. There's a couple areas I think where you can you can really see it. And it does like, like most things, it becomes more clear on a, on a rewatch. So when I was rewatching parts of season four, I really noticed it more, but for sure season four, um, I think there's, there's a micro and a macro, there's a macro and a micro aspect. So on the macro level, I think what you see is seasons one to three, there is this background plot momentum of, okay, you know, eventually we're going to have to get to to Holy week, you know, and then things are kind of locked in and you can't really, you don't have a lot of maneuvering room. Yeah. But seasons one to three have a very um, kind of a short story feel. It feels more like you're you're experiencing these <clears throat> chronicles and that the though there is, you know, you know that there's a background plot. It's not really taking the well, it's in the background. <laughs> it's not taking the four. Um, and I think what that does, that that really allows those character moments, uh, all these individual moments to really shine on their own. Um you're not worried about the the mechanics of kind of getting from A to B. Season four, you definitely feel that kick into gear in a yeah. very intense way. I'm sure we'll we'll get deep into it. So yeah. I, you know, I won't yeah. say too much I, about that. You know, and one thing that I'll just say is that if if the playfulness or the experimentation was a little bit lacking for me on the sort of formal uh, filmographic level, um, I think that there is a daring that's expressed in the writing and in the the way that they've plotted out this season. Uh, I have thoughts about this, right? But they're doing a lot of things um, with their characters that are going maybe, you know, into areas of their own invention. You know, set, setting aside, like, how well those work, I think it is expressive of a kind of boldness that they feel with this material that I think has to be sort of given to their credit because um, you're adapting the gospels. You're telling the story of, of Jesus and of his apostles. And I think the potential for sort of crushing pressure, you know, and, and a sense of, 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 you know, uh, fragility with this source material. um, I think that that could easily speak doom for a project like this but you could you definitely get a sense that playtime is over you know everything is kind of like we have to get through this thing we have to get through this thing we have to get to this point and so those kinds of things that you see especially uh, season one to three where they have room to kind of just hey what if we tried this you know what what if this uh formal idea what if we did the camera this way what if you know so on they don't have time for that is the sense i get season four it's kind of you know we just kind of got to get the story done and you really notice that that that's the biggest change that i noticed uh things are very functional like setups right right. the way that they're doing which is not to say that the time which is not to say that the time is always used uh, yes productively (laughs) and this was my point was that that it did strike me as being very functional as well but i also felt that that maybe some of that that boldness was channeled into a willingness to go meander in areas that aren't uh aren't sort of sticking to the gospel, you know, and specifically this relationship between Thomas and Rama, which we'll get into, I'm sure. Um, that's obviously like a big subplot. It has been. Um, but <clears throat> I think that season four struck me more than any of the previous seasons as fan fiction. And this is part of my criticism, but also an area where I have to tip my hat because I think that the strengths of the chosen to the extent that they that they are 
that there are strengths have so much to do with this courage to tackle this material in a way that's really never been done before. So I want to kind of like just say that from the get go sure, that, sure. that, that, Sure. That you got to give credit where credit's due. You so know? Well, that was your mm-hmm. macro point, Nathan. We'll get to the micro. But any thoughts on that, brother Josh? Uh, before we go to the the micro <laughs> thing, Nathan had to say. Um, it, I mean, it, it did begin to feel the, the pacing felt very different here. Um, and I suppose I um, this is maybe a slightly different point, but one of the things I really enjoyed about the show at its beginning was that it felt like a very um, well thought out and even kind of plausible embellishment of specific details given in the gospel. There was a great attentiveness to what the text actually presents to us. Hmm. As the show has gone on and they've gotten, let's say, more creative in terms of um, the ordering of events, the words said by the various characters, details about their lives, there's been less of that kind of actual filling out of genuine details given to us by the sacred text and more um, how can we make a good story and well, we'll kind of work with what the text gives us, but it's, it's, there's less fidelity there. And to me, that's less compelling if only because before it felt like you were being given how it could have been, you know, and it was really ingenious and moving the way they, they kind of convected that where now we're getting these kind of very large, I mean, it's just to kind of bring it back, I won't go too far into the the Thomas Rama thing, but um, that's kind of a repeat for me of my problem with the Peter um, anger storyline from before. And they keep re- going back to reference that also in connection with the Thomas Rama thing. But um, I-, I wouldn't have had an issue with that being a plot point generally, but because they made it so central yeah. to his character um, in the previous season, uh, as I said before, it kind of distracts and disrupts from your enjoyment of these moments where I feel like in season one, the additional little subplots enhanced um, your experience of the moment with the same kind of emotions that the Gospels present uh, those moments to you, right? They're, they're moments of wonder and awe, um, where here, you know, uh, the the raising of Lazarus is you're very distracted by Thomas's emotions the whole time. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. almost as important as the raising itself, which it's, it's fine. I think to, to, you know, the, the uniqueness of the show is that it's exploring these side characters, but in, in uh, previously those side characters served the function of enhancing your appreciation of the actual story where here, I think it's becoming a little bit of a detraction and it does feel like a kind of a repetition of that. You know, one of the apostles is a major crisis and therefore we need to experience this miracle through the eyes of that character's crisis and his inability to appreciate the miracle Um, in a way that is, I mean, it is kind of, it's, it's working with something of what we get of Thomas's character in the gospels, but it's just so, it's such a big thing. Um, I I feel like it's less in service of explaining um, his, his reactions to Jesus than it is kind of, um, it's just become its own, yep. its own kind of beast. Yep. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of taking something and maybe making it his whole personality or or, or something yeah. like that. But mm-hmm. I, and I'll also say, you know, it, it's I I had more of a problem with it than the Peter uh, thing because I was less invested, and less willing to go along with the Thomas and Rama idea from the get go, and so then I was less willing to buy in to to invest myself in his feelings about you know uh, that that you know, how that went. So, and one more thing, you mentioned the close attention to details in the text that would reveal something, some new uh, dimension, right, of the gospel stories to us. I would say that's a, that's connects to a feeling that I had with the season was that even in the strong moments where they're just, where they're doing something straight from the gospel, I, I no longer had the sense that I was like really learning anything new or seeing a new side of it. I was like, of course, it's emotionally moving when when Jesus raises Lazarus or a number of other moments from the gospel. And yet I kind of felt like it was sort of predictable, like it was sort of I knew how they were going to do it. And and uh, I wasn't really coming away from it feeling like I had learned I had anything new about the gospel had been revealed to me 
which mm. which we had a number of moments, you know, of wow, they singled out this little detail and, and things like that, or in in earlier seasons. Um, but but uh, Nathan, so what was your what was your micro point in how this new season has shifted? Yeah, it, it's it's basically the the point I was saying about um, the the way that they shoot, the way there's they're staging. And, you know, and it goes into the writing as well. It is is functional. It's it's becoming more purely functional. Um, so you see, a concrete example would be most of the scenes in season four. I would say certainly most of the dialogue scenes are characters just standing, um, you know, side by side or they're facing each other. But it's basically it, basically the entire show is shot kind of like an over the shoulder style where it's like character A, character B cut back and forth it's it's like every every single you know television show out there basically and i mean seasons one to three they have that too that's not new in their in terms of their their tool set but you really kind of notice how static um yeah. so much of the action you know and, and you know dialogue of course has a sense of action to it when it's being acted well when it's being um directed you know well uh by no means the characters have to be physically moving for it to be interesting but I don't know. I was I was just struck by that. There's a very kind of almost very limited tableau kind of feel to a lot of the the scenes where it's just talk talk talk, you know, stand stand stand. It feels kind of like the same scene over and over uh, a lot of the time. That, that's like a, that's like the vast majority of of narrative television out there, you know. So that's not, um, you know, I don't want to kind of go on it too hard, but it's just it's significant because I think that sense of stretching, that sense of pushing the envelope. Seasons two, especially in season two, you you really feel the Dallas as a director pushing the envelope and being like, what if we did this? Let's try this. And so, uh, yeah, that's to me, that's the micro thing. It's become very, very functional and less, I would say, creative in the in a moment to moment kind of way. Now, the episodes in this season, uh, I'm not wrong, right, in saying that they are longer on the whole than previous seasons, right? It seemed like more of a greater number of them was like going over an hour. Um, I haven't gone back and compared them, you know, the episode lengths, uh, but, but uh, I, I generally had a feeling of kind of a bit of flab on some of these episodes. There's a lot of time spent in like banter and, you know, uh, well, we, we can get into that, but there, yeah, there's a lot of banter. There's a lot of hang, hanging out, you know, but stuff that is kind of, um, either kind of like the usual like frivolous chit chat or like some drama or like melodramatic things that I, that I'm not buying into. Um, but uh, I, maybe uh, I, for the viewers, um, especially those who haven't seen the season, maybe we should just like list the major themes of the season really quick. So this, this takes, takes us up to the beginning of Holy Week with Jesus's uh, entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and I guess for me, the overarching theme, and you guys can add in anything else that I'm not mentioning as important, but the overarching theme would be basically Jesus preparing his followers for his death and uh, and his resurrection, of course, and um, and also being heartbroken and frustrated that they can't hear what he's saying to them. And um, I would say that uh, maybe this is the first maybe this is the first season where we see Jesus cry more than we see him you know, laugh and make jokes. I don't know. There's still some of that, but, um, but, uh, there's a lot of that. It's definitely like heading in a darker direction. Um, another, uh, subplot, important biblical subplot. I mean, it's not one that's given to us in the Bible, but it's, you know, trying to explain the Bible is, you know, Judas's fall, Judas's temptation, his disillusionment, his dishonesty, uh, trying to explain the, the line about him, having, you know, steal, stolen things from the, from the money bag. And, um, and then the major, the major, you know, wholly fictional subplot is the Thomas and Rama story and spoiler, uh, in episode three, uh, Rama gets killed and much of the rest of the season is, uh, involves Thomas, uh, you know, freaking out about that or shutting down about that. And, you know, similar to the Peter thing, struggling with why Jesus allowed this to happen or why he didn't raise her from the dead. And again, uh, like, like Peter in season three, Thomas is frustrated when he sees other miracles being performed that Jesus did not perform for him or for, for Rama. Um, yeah. And, and we get some scenes in season four with the Pharisees. And so we're sort of introduced a little bit more into 
uh, they're sort of different schools of thought as pertains to you know, political considerations or questions of prophecy, um, how the the Sanhedrin sort of operate together um, in Jerusalem. So that's and and there's two two of these Pharisees in particular who are kind of drawn to Jesus, but maybe end up having different responses to him. Yeah, um, yeah and it, you know it's interesting that like. I think in previous seasons we found the Pharisee, you know, side plots to be more, f- more maybe more functional and less interesting than some of the main, you know, biblical plots. But I almost hate to say it in this season, I found the Pharisee subplots to be much more interesting than hanging out with Jesus and the apostles, which is sad <laughs> to say. Um, but be- but but again, because when they were doing when the show was like doing what it does best, it wasn't doing it as well or as interestingly as it seems to have done in the past. Like uh, even the scenes that I found moving were still kind of like, well, my life wouldn't be any different if I had never seen that, you know? And then, uh, and then there was just so much stuff where I was just groaning, like this is stupid dialogue or I hate this subplot, <laughs> that, that kind of stuff, or, or just like, or in some cases, not things that they're doing that I don't like, that, that I don't like that are new, but just like, okay, I've been watching this show for four seasons and these bad habits are just becoming more and more set in stone and more and more obvious and I'm getting more and more tired of them, you know? And so, yeah, like the Pharisee stuff was actually a breath of fresh air because that was the only stuff pretty much where I felt like I'm in this new world that I don't really know much about and at least I kind of feel like I'm learning something. I don't know how much of it is, you know, made up about the different sub pharisaical subcommittees on, you know, uh, you know, gender inequality and stuff. But, um, but I, you know, I, I just made that up. That that's not in the show. I know that some, <laughs> some haters of the chosen would like to think that that's in there, but it's not. Um, so anyway, I, I yeah, actually found that stuff interesting. I found the character of Yusuf, you know, compelling, and these kind of guys who are secretly trying to help Jesus on on the inside of the Sanhedrin and the religious authorities. Um, you know, people's mileage may vary, but that stuff was actually more enjoyable to me than hanging out with uh, the disciples uh, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to like lead off my remarks by saying I appreciate this, this kind of this this boldness that Dallas and the rest of the team have with respect to this, this subject, because um, I think it would be very easy to treat it with kid gloves and not be able to, to tackle it in the way that they've done, you know, this episodic many series seasons long series. Um, But, you know, it's like, uh, there's an expression I once heard about, um, washing the dishes like if, you, if you're washing the dishes you're going to break them um something like that that like you can't blame someone for breaking dishes if they're also the one who's washing them like it, it, there's a working hazard i guess is what i'm trying to say um like it might be easy to criticize someone for breaking a dish very if you're just sitting very polish. sitting around not cleaning them you know so these th- th- these artists are doing the work um and uh, and so I want to be mindful of that when I couch my criticism, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that this 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 season was the most fan fictiony of all of the seasons. And and you're right. It's it's at its absolute best when it's hewing closely to the Gospels, when it's when it's really getting granular and attending to detail and when it's, you know, taking advantage of these performances that we have in Jonathan Rumi or, um, you know, the the actress who plays Mary Magdalene or the chemistry that's emerging among the apostles to sort of flesh things out in a way that's new and that, that, that sort of gets me to re, re reconsider things. Um, uh, and, and in its own way makes like a definite contribution perhaps to the deposit of sacred art. I, I think that, every season so far has had moments that are going to stick with me and that I'll go back to. And this season did, but it had the fewest of them. Yeah, um, I agree. And, and why? Well, I would say it's because there was more invention. There was more of a, a venturing off into, you know, these plot lines that were powers that, that, that were just the, 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 
the um, product of their own powers of of, of creation, you know, yeah. and that uh, when they began to play fast and loose with, you know, certain maybe even biblical things happening in a different context or with a different person, you know, that really started to make me feel a little uneasy. You know, there's that that quote um, that's sometimes attributed to St. John Paul II after he watched The Passion. Um, I don't know if this is... It is, is a, as it was. Yes, it is as it was. And I, I just think you cannot say that about this series. You know what I mean? Right. And, and that maybe was true to a certain extent from the beginning, but it's become more glaringly obvious, and it's especially so in this season. Right. Um, so maybe, you know... Maybe that's enough said right now. But. Yeah. Well, I'll just say, you know, to put my shoes on the table or whatever the expression is, <laughs> um, I <laughs> just the first word that and I thought of the shoes of the fisherman. Isn't that like a play by Claudel or something? Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, shoes on the table. Dish what? Like what happens when when you host a dinner, guys? Like what's, what's happening at your houses? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about as chaotic as these dinners you see with the apostles <laughs> in, the, uh, in the chosen. Um, so uh, anyway, um, you know, uh, this was the first season where I felt for much of the season like I was watching it out of professional obligation primarily yeah. to, because we were going to review it. Uh, my favorite, most of my favorite moments are in the first two episodes and we can talk about them and then... Something happens in episode three and things just really go off the rails. Um, I think we should be maybe it'd be helpful to do a quick just a quick like plot overview of kind of where. Well, I just mentioned we're 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 sort of in this period leading up to the pa uh, Holy Week and the Passion. Um, yeah. So the season ends with with Jesus riding off on the donkey. Yeah. And also the to... raising of Lazarus. We mentioned that is also an important thing in the last episode or the second to last episode. I, I don't remember, but it's sort of like says, the, yeah, the yeah, miracle that happens. this Right. Season. And he says it's his last public yeah. sign. Um, so um, yeah, I don't know if how there's, I don't think there's much else to yeah. needs to be said. Cause we, we talked about the other plot. Lines. Well, okay. Well, I'm just going to, we don't need to make this a super long segment, but I'm just going to mention a couple of my favorite moments because they are kind of in this, in this, area between like straight gospel adaptation and like total invention where sure. i think the show has sometimes succeeded i would say um my 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 two favorite moments from a from a spiritual perspective where i thought i was getting something out of it spiritually were first i think it's in the first episode there's an exchange between simon the zealot and judas and they're washing they're they're taking on their assigned task from jesus of washing clothes and Judas is kind of complaining about why don't we pay someone else to do this? Why don't we raise more money? It's not efficient. And that, you know, the, the, the scene has a lot of explicit subtext, if there can be such a thing, uh, about, you know, washing out, you know, the old, the old dirt from your clothes, washing out your, the old parts of yourself, both Simon the Zealot uh, and Judas have this old self that they've left behind, you know, uh, ostensibly to be with Jesus. And Simon has done that in a very definitive way. Um, and so he is sort of encouraging Judas in this direction. But what I thought was really cool, and it was one of these, you know, three or four moments in the show where I've been like, wow, they like actually hit something like very, almost very specifically Catholic there was when Judas is saying, you know, uh, I want, I want to, I want to do, you know, handle the money more efficiently and and uh and 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 simon says did jesus tell you to do it more efficiently and he says no he just told me to keep the money bags and he's like okay then just do that and judas like has trouble accepting this idea and he's really like investing himself in this special task and it really made me think of uh the way that religious orders are run in the catholic church where like there's often concern about like not letting one person get too identified with one particular task or like, you know, so it becomes like a source of ego for them and people get getting moved around on things or the way that certain orders handled money. I mean, I think of the Carthusians recent decision to to scale down their green chartreuse production because it's like we're not trying to get this to everyone in the world and and sell as much of it as possible. This is a means to an end for us. And so we're not 
we're deliberately choosing not to optimize because we're concerned about optimizing something else. Um, and so that was one moment where I was like, that's like a really specific kind of um, insight that I think, you know, I, I'm sure it may not be a specifically Catholic insight, but it, it very much resonated. And it was one of those times where it felt like a Protestant, like getting onto something that, that feels very much at home in Catholic spirituality. Um, and then the other favorite scene from a spiritual perspective was the whole, um, I guess a couple of scenes where we finally get resolution on the, the tension between Peter and Matthew. Um, because of course, Matthew started out as a tax collector who was causing trouble for Peter and his business as a fisherman and endangering, you know, possibly leading him to be put in prison, you know, uh, and um, Peter has been holding onto this grudge. And Matthew has also been sort of holding onto a grudge that Peter has been treating him poorly, but there's never been an apology between the two. And uh, this comes to a head when Peter is named, given his name, you know, of Peter and, and named the rock, you know, by uh, Jesus. And Matthew comes to Jesus to complain about this. And there's this beautiful scene where, um, Jesus is basically telling Matthew to examine his own conscience and really think deeply for the first time about what he did or threatened to do to Peter uh, all that time ago. And you can see Matthew squirming and trying to rationalize, not asking for, for forgiveness. At one time he, he says like, I just wanted to, you know, leave those things in the past or so something like that. And yeah. that is just so true to life, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and and our 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 desire not to ask for permission to confess old sins that we remember that we never confessed or not or or not to do reparation for sins that we've already confessed but haven't ma made reparation to whether that be to God or to a, a particular person on earth that we've harmed um and so i thought that was really great and and really um edifying and then of course there's the the converse where jesus encourages peter to forgive matthew and he, you know, he also kind of rebels against it momentarily, but gives in finally in his own brash way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was really beautiful. And both of those are things that are clearly these connections you can make between the apostles that are not laid out in the Gospels. There's no, no special connection, special conversation between uh, Simon the Zealot and Judas, but they both have this background and you can see how, how to put those together in a conversation. Yeah. And likewise with Peter and Matthew. OK, well, Peter is, you know. A fisherman he's got this business matthew was a tax collector in the same town and this is plausible that there would be some tension between matthew and at least one of the other apostles yeah. on this point and yeah. so i think that's like such a legitimate but but also creative and genuinely spiritually insightful approach to those yes those kind of moments yes yes and and i'm most interested in those moments because they have to do with the apostles with these characters that are not the product of the show writer's imagination but these historical figures who are revered, you know, saints and 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 uh, foundation stones of of the church, and so, you know, this is I think when the show is is doing its best, um, its best work, you know, and and saying things that are most meaningful, and maybe not so much when we're following, you know, somebody that that is like my my degree of investment into them is like wholly dependent upon what this show has been able to bring to the, mm. to the fore, you know, um, as opposed to say any subplot dealing with Peter, I'm feeling it because I'm knowing, Oh, this is my guy. This is my, my first Pope, you know? Right. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, my other, my other two favorite moments are the whole Herod and Salome scene. Uh -huh. I thought that was nicely handled. Better than the, the gospel according to St. Matthew by Pasolini did, because it was like totally boring. Yeah, yeah, that was movie. boring in that film. And then this, they they walked a nice, a good line between like overly prurient mm -hmm. and it was more just kind of yeah. like a freaky modern dance. It was like a great thing. I, I, I think it was a great example of how to make something like signal uh, lusty uh without without being it mm -hmm. you know so yeah. we, this is like a, this is a problem that we've talked about on the show is like how do you do you like 
signify yeah. sensuality without without indulging it. Yes, mm-hmm. and and they 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 did so with that sequence. Yeah, and it required a lot of craft, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you know, not the least of which was this incredible virtuosity of her of her movements and like mm-hmm. executing these in- complicated, you know, like gymnastic things. Right, but but also you know just the way that people are responding and the way that it's framed and like everything sort of gives you the impression of like, okay, we know what this is, but it's not working on me in that way. Yeah. You know? And then a scene late in the season where, where Jesus confides in, in Mary about his disappointment with his disciples. And I thought that was just a nice quiet scene where once again, these Protestants don't believe the same things about Mary as we do, but they have, definitely kept her in like a position of superior enlightenment yeah. to everybody else That's basically good. where yeah. Jesus is confiding in her in a way that he doesn't with others. So right. I like that. Does anybody else have any special moments they want to single out? Uh, maybe brother Josh, uh, you could. You could um, well, I, I also really enjoyed the um, watching the uh, evolution of Matthew and Peter's relationship and, and the moment of their reconciliation was really touching. I actually teared up a little bit at that uh, when, when Peter embraces him. Um, but I, I mean, I agree with essentially everything you've, you've both said. It's, it's the moments when they are kind of embellishing those relations. I mean, Rhema's not even, she's a completely fictional character. She's not mentioned yeah. anywhere in the gospels. So the, the, I was far less invested in that as a result. Um, also, I was really distracted by whatever her headgear was because it's clearly like a modern kind of stitching thing. Uh, it's, just, and it's so uh, visible. I, I, I don't even know what you're talking at. about. <laughs> it just—it looks like the end of like a. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't even visualize what you're talking about. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. Um, but <laughs> things like that jump out at me. Um, the candles, of course, always trigger me. Uh, but the. Um, uh, yeah, but I loved that. I, I actually enjoyed a lot of the stuff with the Sanhedrin. Um, I think it would probably be, some of it would have been a little annoying for like Jewish friends of mine. I had a Jewish friend watch like the first season. And he was, um, he was, he was irritated by like how explainy it was. Yes. Like, oh, you know, yes. this is when we do the Passover, you know, like I they're know. telling characters that ostensibly are doing these things all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I for, you kind of have to for a Christian audience in some way, but there's but a lot you, of that kind of explain. Not in you know? that way. Not in yeah. that way. You have to yeah. make it intelligible somehow. I think there's too much explaining in yeah. general in the show. And there's, uh, but the I, I don't want to get up too far off track on, on criticisms. The, <laughs> the favorite moments. I like the Sanhedrin stuff, um, especially because uh, previous portrayals I've seen tend to either make them kind of um cartoonishly villainous um and perhaps too homogenous it's like everyone there agrees and everyone there is of the same party um and where if you read the book of acts and the gospels you see that that's clearly not the case there's sadducees and pharisees on the sanhedrin at least you know and possibly other parties are um around although they're not mentioned to be on the sanhedrin uh, but these two parties are in, in very, very much in disagreement with each other. And the degree of comfort with the status quo, including Rome's involvement in that. And Rome at this period in time would have been illegally by Jewish law selecting the high priest each year. So all, wow. all kinds oh, of wow. like weird stuff happening uh, in terms of what, what should be kosher. Wow. Um, but, uh, but you see in the show very well presented like this kind of um, disagreements. You you kind of get a sense of like what the Sanhedrin's purpose is, the sort of things that they're concerned about. Um, and as you said, you know, that was often more interesting than the plot lines with the disciples because it, it felt like there was movement there. There was like new things happening, whereas with the apostles, it often kind of feels like more of the same. And, um, you know, if there's something that I could say on that point, too, is that I think with these uh, with these Sanhedrin characters, with the with the Pharisees, there's more latitude that I'm willing to give in terms of where these characters end up and what they're they're exploring than I would say with the with Jesus and with the apostles, mm. simply because I I have much more information about Jesus and right. the apostles and about what happened right. and you know who these people are. Mm. So when things like the subplot with Thomas and Rema come in. It's like, okay, this is pushing it a little bit. I'm not 
I'm not incapable of imagining. I'm not incapable of suspending disbelief and sort of rolling with it. But you better be really, really doing this to some some like profound effect. Otherwise, it's it's really taken me out of things. Right. And Rayma is a wholly fictional character, whereas the Sanhedrin are maybe fictional as individuals in the show. But as a group, they're very real and they're very important. And sure. we do want to understand why they do what they do. Right. Know? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's a yeah, that's a good point, yeah. too. Any yep. other things you liked, uh, Josh? Specific scenes, I should say. I did like the um, the the actual Jesus's entrance into Jerusalem, as, as so far as we we got the lead up to that, um, and and the kind of I, I was very, I, as you probably remember, I was very frustrated by the whole setup for the Sermon on the Mount and how it felt like <laughs> here's the mega preacher getting ready to go on stage, and we're going to make sure he has like big bright colors and yeah. flyers everywhere and all that nonsense. Um, and here there was much less of that kind of distracting stuff. It felt like you could kind of just take in the moment. The one thing that kind of ruined some of it for me was the taking of that line from the Eucharistic discourse and sticking it in the middle of that. Um, oh, but yeah. uh, otherwise, otherwise, so frustrating. I, I, I really enjoyed that. The, the line is Jesus, uh, Peter saying to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall be turned, you have the words of eternal life. And they just took that and put that in a totally different context rather yeah. than the bread of life uh, discourse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, James, any favorite scenes or anything? Um, I, my, my, my favorite moment was when Jesus finally arrives, uh, in Bethany and Lazarus has died and we get that moment of him weeping. Um, right. There's, there's a lot made of, of this verse. That's like the shortest verse in the gospels. Jesus wept. Um, and and so I was, of course, curious how they would handle that. And I thought that this moment was just very, very moving. Um, Rumi does this interesting thing where he he turns around and like kind of goes through and looks almost one by one at each of the apostles before he breaks down. So there's this kind of like suspension, this like held tension as he's looking around and you know I, I i think that you could read this moment in any number of ways but uh for me what was like alive in that moment was this feeling of loneliness uh this frustration that we've seen him express at none of the apostles really understanding him or his teaching um but also in this moment them not really understanding his pain and uh as an aside, we get a couple of moments uh, in the in this in this season where, almost like frustratedly, Jesus affirms, "I am human," or "I'm human." You know, it happens twice. Um, one time with Mary, and that's less frustrated, but another time I think with Lazarus. Um. Anyway, uh, so there's this tension as he's looking at all of the apostles, and I kind of just felt this. Um, this pain because of this this looking for for consolation and not finding it, and then the breaking down, and of course it made me think about you know the 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 spiritual work of reparation and and what this does to console the heart of Jesus, um, which. You know, those those words can be very abstract, you know, very kind of hard to understand. But one of the strengths of a TV show like this and the way that they've done it is they've focused so much on this. Um, this this, you know, personality of Jesus, this this human um, approach, approachability and warmth so that when you see this pain, you know, you can kind of link it up with your your uh phantasm of the real Jesus and 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 it can help sort of deepen this motive for for making prayers of reparation and for consoling the heart of Jesus, you know, who right. still looks around in this moment of tension asking like will anybody come and and then who who is who is it that comes and consoles him it's his mother so right. that the uh, he kind of falls to the ground breaks down and and then mary comes 
eventually and is consoling him. And so all of that was very spiritually significant for me. Well, his role as the man of sorrows is mentioned. And yeah. Is, is there a line in scripture about like, I looked for someone who would console me and I found none, so, something like that? Yeah. I'm yeah. very much paraphrasing, but... I, I wonder if they were specifically inspired by that and having him literally look around at the apostles, yeah. you know. But, um, you but know. there was also this kind of neat quality where it was almost like he was he was looking into them like, okay, is everybody paying attention? Is everybody like going to see now what I am about to do? You right. know, like, like there's something of sp spiritual significance even in this action. Like I want my followers paying attention here yeah you know but also the willfulness of like sort of like how he gives his life up he chooses to let yes. go of his life he chooses to cry right um, right yeah exactly yeah and yeah. you know i i i was wondering how this was going to be played leading up to it because i i noticed in this season that a lot of the time even in situations where you wouldn't expect it uh they have Jesus, they have Jonathan Rumi getting teared up while saying things or getting like more emotional than I would have expected him to say something to someone in the Bible. And I wasn't always into that, but I was thinking, well, if they have him tearing up so much in the show, like doesn't that sort of take away from the uniqueness of Jesus wept? And maybe it does, but they just, it was a much bigger moment. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. he, he actually breaks down. Right. You know, yeah. and, right. and so it still worked. It didn't feel like, right. well, I've already seen this a right. bunch of right. times. Uh, any other scenes you'd like to single out? Um, I think that there was this very nice moment after the raising of Lazarus where Mary Magdalene goes to check yeah. out the empty tomb. And of course, this is sort of, it has these echoes of of where she'll end up in being the first to check out the empty tomb after Jesus's crucifixion and death but um but you know i i think that that uh this quiet moment you know with one of these characters just sort of being there and and sort of probing you know, looking around, questioning. This was this was very powerful for me because I was I was there with her doing the same thing, you know, kind of gazing in wonder at this empty tomb. And and so here's Mary Magdalene kind of disburdened from any other plot uh, necessities, you know, to advance any particular plot lines or resolve anything that has been, you know, I, I guess I point to this moment to say that that I wish that there were more things like this, you know, um, uh, because it was almost like the counterpoint to Brother Josh, what you were what you were pointing out earlier of of Thomas's uh, perspective on this miracle, almost eclipsing the miracle itself, and uh, and here Mary Magdalene kind of just approaching almost with like fear and trembling. This empty tomb um, was had a totally opposite effect. Right. Unfortunately, they ended that same episode with that psalm that she she just like it's like a flat or a flash forward to her in the future, uh, yeah. like reading a psalm that she wrote to Thomas, and it's just like this does not sound like any psalm I've ever heard, and I've heard a hundred fifty, you know. Uh, um, it just like sounds like slam poetry or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it's it was really bad. bad. And it's so long, it just keeps going. It's really long. Um, yeah. But this it, isn't it the really, same moment, right? No, but it's the end of the same episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. as it comes after that, they could have ended the episode with her just Thomas, like, we were talking about the things that we like. Okay? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> we'll have to come back to that. Yeah, I keep, yeah. I keep well, Nathan, that what, what, what about you? Do you have any particular favorite moments? I do. Um, my favorite moment of the season is the one Thomas mentioned, the um, Matthew's uh, fireside. That sounds funny. <laughs> They're sitting in front of a campfire. Uh, <laughs> Matthew's uh, examination of conscience with with uh, Christ. And um, I think it's just it's it's beautifully, I would say, even perfectly kind of put together uh, the the listening aspect, the the, the you know, Jesus doesn't let Matthew off the hook for anything. 
but he just does it so gently um, that um, I can, I think even when the show is all finished, you know, years from now, that's going to be one of the scenes that I remember and even take with me into, into prayer, into times with the blessed sacrament. Like it's just so beautifully judged how they, how they lead Matthew, how they they just show the process of, of examination and, and that gentleness of, is that really the case, you know, like of our Lord asking, yeah. like, is that really the case? Like think, you know, and letting, letting the penitent kind of discover the truth um, without having it being forced upon him. I, I don't know. I just think they absolutely nailed that. Um, uh, other scenes that I really liked, I really liked in, um, it's a single image more than a scene. The uh, episode four, uh, uh, the very end when uh, Jesus is by himself and he sees the, the, the oil press um, that Zebedee oh, and yeah. the, the women are working. And, yeah, and we see cool. for the first time in the show, we see the process of making, pressing the oil out of the olives and, and in the way that they were doing it, I guess in, in the first century with uh, heaping these stones uh, onto the weight one at a time. And the image of the oil pouring down is so intense. It's so, yeah. and it, you know, it's intercut quite, quite well with Jonathan Ruby reacting to it. So this is, you know, very Soviet kind of like, you know, association uh, <laughs> going on. Um, but Hey, it works, it works incredibly well um, to, to, there's a visceral quality to that image uh, is a documentary quality to that image really where, you know, you're seeing kind of just the oil dripping and there's something, yes. I don't know, it has, it has a real power to it that is uh, kind of leaps out of the show out of the season in particular. Uh, there's, there's a few images that kind of hit with the same force. Um, and then uh, I, I'll say I, I loved the the raising of Lazarus, uh, even with the the problems with um, the Thomas elements. Uh, what I loved about it was, um, it, I think they really did a good job capturing that this is an event for the onlookers that is is simultaneously horrifying and the most joyful like it's it they captured that whole range of emotion especially with the reactions of the of the various onlookers and there there's something absolutely terrifying about that image of the completely wrapped Lazarus like stumbling out of the grave like it's it's genuinely it's it's incredibly jarring because you know you don't it, it's hard you you don't really know what's going on you know it's clear what's going on but at the same time there's I don't know it's it's such an interesting merging of kind of of all the, all the mixed emotions, I think that would happen in that, in that situation. It's, it's, um, so for like the visceral kind of capturing the reality aspect, I, I love that part. And then, uh, one more that I really liked was the, uh, Simon the zealot, uh, as he's getting the donkey at the end of the last episode, he goes in to get the, to get the colt, um, for the procession and his interaction with the owner, I think it's just really, there's, there's such a like sweetness to how you can see, I mean, all throughout the show, I think Z, Z as they call him, is one of the strongest um, of the disciple characters that they've kind of constructed out of, you know, out of what we have in scripture. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just love what that actor is bringing to the, to the table and, and that th there's a real, there's a real vital moment there where you can see the devotion and you can see the excitement, even the excitement that's latent within, uh, you know, the Jewish people waiting for the Messiah that everyone kind of has. It's not just the apostles who are, have that being activated within them, but everyone is waiting. And that kind of that, just that thing that they share, you know, this random guy realizing that I have a piece to play in, in the coming of the Messiah. Like he's taking my, animal um i don't know uh, yeah i think it was really really beautifully and, and gently kind of handled um so yeah and yeah. it's cool that they they tried to to handle it because that that passage in the gospel is so weird <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> there's no explanation given to you for how this is going to work but it does so uh, you yeah. know this yeah. was i was I, I i was definitely thinking okay how are they going to pull this one off? And they did, you know. I, I agree. I really liked how they did that. Um, in, in the same kind of lead up uh, scene, I also really enjoyed Joanna's moment of like excitement where she buys mm. like all the palms and starts distributing them and just like the glee on her face. This character who like you're watching her look very dour 
most of the show. Um, it was just wonderful style. to kind of see, yeah, just just kind of see that re- moment of release and enthusiasm. Yeah. That's cool. um, I thought was really beautiful. And it's like a, a self-giving enthusiasm, right? Um, which we kind of saw implied before when she sends them all that um, valuable mm-hmm. stuff to, to help fund the ministry, but you don't actually actively see her give it. Um, yes, well, you know, and that was one of my other favorite scenes was when they got that box from Joanna and everybody got a little gift and it was just one by one. Yeah, Step everyone right everyone had one item that only they knew how to identify and where it they was could Father sell it. Christmas in yeah. Narnia. <laughs> or, or <laughs> or Gil- you know? It was Chronicles of Narnia. That was one of the scenes where I was like, I can't believe they're like making me watch this entire process. Much like the fifteen I know the, it was so pointless. The 15, especially especially because all the objects, what did, what did they end up doing with them? Just going and selling them. Right. So there was no need, need for the signification of like, well, this one for you and this one for you. But that wasn't <laughs> as bad as the, the, the 15. There was a 15 minute cold open to one episode where after Rayma is killed, they just flash back to seemingly every one of the disciples like thinking earlier about how they wanted to console Thomas. And I'm like... <laughs> It was just brutal, man. And they're all like walking in slow motion. There was like almost that entire, it felt like that entire 15 minutes was in slow motion. Anyway. Um, I just wanted to say what, yeah. one other thing I really liked was uh, 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 Martha and Mary are two of my favorite figures from the Gospels. And I love the, I have complaints about how certain scenes are handled. We'll get to later, but I love the embodiment of them. I love the, the actors playing them. I think the, the characterizations of them are, are just so, I, I, I just love them. <laughs> I love how they're handling it, but in particular the, the scene of um, Martha before she complains to our Lord about um, Mary, you know, not helping. There's a bit, the, you know, moment where we see her assembling, you know, some of the snacks that she's giving to the disciples. And I love that they, they take the time to actually see, to actually just watch her put it together right. and see yeah. the care. And they have Jesus is moist, like that. back, back in the mix. So you, she's like sort of hearing yeah. it, but not really listening to him. And yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's, I love that little moment. Um, just that so as an aside, well like it, it, there's a French film that I saw recently from, from last year uh, called the taste of things is the, is the English title. And it's entirely about like, French people in the 1880s just cooking these incredible things in real, not in real time, but it's just, it's basically half of it's just watching um, Juliette Bonoche, Bonoche like cook. And it's, it's absolutely like wonderful <laughs> to, to sort of just, so that's reminded me of that, the process, like processing the process of um, fictional or, or fictionalized portrayals of people making things <laughs> is like, to me, that's more fun than watching actual cooking shows. Um, <laughs> well, in right, case you know. didn't notice, Nathan, I was trying to signal a shift into the things that we didn't like. Yeah, um, I know. I just doesn't, doesn't the door. have to be, I just, this doesn't I, have to be like a, 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 a round table, like list all your problems. Yeah. Well, but, I think we but, should just talk about episode three, first of all. Right? Well, first I just want to say that Martha... I didn't like that her whole character was just I'm a busybody who 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 worries about the house. Like that this became I get I get that this is the most important aspect of her uh that we remember from the gospels, but like it was her whole character and it was like how everybody related to her. This was frustrating for me. Although I I hear your uh your um cry. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> All right, so can we just talk about episode three? Okay. That's the most important thing, really. Episode three. Um, episode three. The, the, the worst way that they could have possibly resolved this pointless romance subplot. I, you know. Well, well can, can we, maybe before we do that, can we just, maybe I just, I want to throw this question out there. What, yes. What do you think is the best interpretation for why Rayma as a character has to exist. Whether they My, did it well or not is another question, but what, okay. what, what's kind of the best version of this? I, I think, I think there's a couple reasons. One of them is probably the, the obvious one of they wanted to have a, a romance subplot and give, you know, one of the apostles that, that dimension, you know, um, in addition to Peter. 
Right. In addition to Peter, Peter's that already married, kind of so out. you know it's more of a stable situation. But um, I I had the thought that they definitely want Mary Magdalene. You can't have a show. It's not allowed. You can't have a show that's mostly focused on men and there aren't any major female characters who are in epi- every episode. Uh, that's not allowed. So uh, Mary Magdalene, everybody loves Mary Magdalene. Everybody has, you know, different thoughts about Mary Magdalene and who she really was. And she's got to be a big part of the show. And she's a great part of the show. Um, but they've definitely amplified her character and put her in every episode traveling with the apostles being with them everywhere she and these other fictional women are are you know basically be on the receiving end of all of these you know words of wisdom from jesus along with the apostles but my point is that i think that it would have been weird to have mary magdalene traveling with the apostles on her own and therefore she needs like a couple of women friends who right. are <laughs> traveling with them i think that like there's a practical need for more women than just one in the group if you're going to do that so mm-hmm. that that's my interpretation but you know i would have accepted just basically like uh like prop dressing like okay here's mary magdalene the female character we care about and then here are like the the random like female extras that she's flanked by you know right like right. this this would have been acceptable for me the thing is we do get certain women specifically named in the gospels that follow them around and it sounds like there are several of them now we know i'll actually just read it here it's in luke chapter 8 verses 1 through 3. soon afterward he went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of god and the 12 were with him and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities i think in the show that's that line there is kind of just represented by Mary Magdalene because she's the only one that we, well, there's the, um, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian. One, of course, but the, Tamar. um, but T- Tamar is, is fictional, but we, we have the three named women Tamar who are healed or liberated. She is Sorry. a little boring. Um, <laughs> ma- but it says <laughs> it gives us Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager and Susanna and many others. And it adds, who provided for them out of their means. So we have these various women, and what we know about them was they were either healed or freed from evil spirits, and they helped to fund the ministry. And we get the names of three of them, but we're told there are many others. So we know for a fact there were several women. What was that? I forgot that Joanna was real. Yeah, well, and that's one of the reasons I like her character is because she's like, I think it is a good embellishment of someone that we have mentioned. She's actually mentioned twice. She's mentioned there. In Luke, and then um, further on, as one of the women that go to the empty tomb and come back to report it to the to the eleven apostles. Um, spoiler alert: there's only eleven at that point. But the um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but so yeah, so we get those three named women, and I, and as you know, as we get in the show, Joanna's husband's named Chusa. You know, often if there's like a random name thrown in there, it's either because they were a person of historical significance that would have been widely known or they were someone that converted and became a Christian. In this case, I doubt like subsequent generations remembered that Herod's household manager's name was Chusa. So I kind of assume Chusa probably becomes a Christian at some point and is known to the Christian community. Um, But so so we know for a fact there were women that followed him around. Whether they would have been privy to all the teachings and the way the twelve were is another matter. They're, they're yes, this is certainly, something yeah. that that frustrates me because it's almost like they become de facto apostles. There's no sense that these twelve sort of occupy a a, a privileged position, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 even even within that, you know, we often talk about Peter, James, and John being in a special sort of inner circle. Yeah. And then of course, John being the beloved uh, disciple. So these kind of gradations don't really exist in the show as of yet, no. as far as I can tell. Well, and it's, um, it's, it's very confusing in scripture too, because you get the apostles are sent out to proclaim the, uh, the kingdom to heal people's infirmities and to cast out demons. Um, But then you also get 72 disciples that are sent out to do exactly those things. Mm. The things that kind of, that explicitly distinguish the 12, I mean, you could probably amass more things. They're given the authority to bind and loose. Um, 
they are later on in, in John only given the authority to forgive sins just as Jesus had been doing throughout the Gospels, right? That's kind of saved for the end. Um, they, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? It's gone from my mind now. Um, oh, they're, they're the only ones seemingly present at the Last Supper, right? And given the command to do this in memory of me. Um, well, I have a feeling, I have a feeling they ain't going to be the only ones present. Yeah, yeah, we'll see about but, that. But, but, you know, and it's because they weren't the only ones present during this binding and loosing um, uh, bestowal of, of authority, right? Well, they yeah, go to Caesarea in, in, Philippi and, and the women are there too mm-hmm. when Jesus is addressing them, saying that he's going to give them this, this, this authority. Yeah, that that's yeah. kind of funny how they how they handled that. In in Matthew's gospel, it happens twice that Jesus gives the authority to bind and loose. He first gives it specifically to Peter in Matthew sixteen eighteen, and then in Matthew eighteen eighteen, he gives it to the college of the apostles collectively. Um, right. The thing that kind of sets the Peter episode apart is that he says singularly to Peter, although in the show they kind of make it like it's a plural. Yeah. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Right, right. I, I that that obviously upset a lot of Catholics. I think that they kind of made that generalized. Yeah. In in, in to a certain degree, it didn't bother me as much. I think as I think it yeah. bothered other people because the church historically has referred to the keys as something that is collectively held by the entire episcopate and presbyterate. And that I was, was chill given. with it. You know, yeah. I could yeah. roll with that. Yeah. But but yeah. that 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 it's it's like Tamar Tamar. Tamar, is she gonna bind and loose? Really? <laughs> you know, like she's she's not even a Jew. You know, like you don't you don't give give to the the the, the dogs what's meant for the children. Okay, <laughs> like his his mission is to the Jews right now. What's she doing going around with well, them? I I. I I was bothered by that at first because he's sort of looking around at all of them when he's saying, I give you the keys. But then later, Matthew refers to Peter specifically as having been given the keys. So in the dialogue, they do like yeah. right. still leave Peter with us. And there's a role. big emphasis on Peter as the rock yeah. in the subsequent arguments. So that's very clear. I feel like they kind of yeah. fixed it even, more or less. Even the, way, <laughs> even the way that Jonathan Rumi plays that on second viewing, I, I, I could be reading this into, into it, but my sense was he was like in his direction as an actor. He was really sure. focusing on Peter. I'm sure that he know? was, but it doesn't change that the show <laughs> has given us these, these women who are just basically uh, indistinguishable from the apostles. You would be forgiven if you, if you knew nothing about the early church, if you knew nothing about who the apostles were or their significance, you would be forgiven for thinking that, you know, Mary Magdalene occupied the same level, the same standing mm-hmm. uh, as as these these twelve do. Yeah, you know, with the exception that she's not in that one montage where they are sent to go cast out demons. Right, and, and that's preach. the only time really where we we see any separation. The one and only time. The rest of the time, it's you know, yeah. So we've got Rama <laughs> for, for these various reasons, and we've got this subplot of you know Thomas and Rama. And I always begrudge this a little bit, but I never knew, are they actually going to have them get married? I was like, I'm not sure if they're actually going to do this. I had the feeling that there was going to be some kind of fake out. Yes. And that was the on. only thing that was keeping it interesting for me because I was like, OK, well, <laughs> the, the, the only bright side to this is that they're going to have to figure out some way of dealing with it. You know, like maybe there will be some sort of edifying conversation between the two of them where they both decide to be like, you know, virgins for the kingdom you know like that that would be cool you know but Can't like i said protestant show dude they chose the <laughs> least interesting way of resolving the least interesting but also the most like chaos creating yes way. well and yeah. also yeah. It, it doesn't resolve it because now we have to deal with with mopey thomas until the resurrection you know which is just so there's too much of the mopey characters yes. They're exhausting. <laughs> Peter was exhausting when he was moping. Thomas was exhausting when he was moping. Especially because nobody's gonna, nobody's just rebuking the guy, you know? Yeah. Like someone needs to go over and give this guy like a no. smack. What kind of killed me is when, I forget which apostle says to, to Judas, like, you have to learn to be sensitive. I'm like, these are, this is like the first <laughs> century. What are you talking about? Like, no, who's, or, or... who would have said that back then? 
<laughs> well, there, there was this multiple scenes. Um, so in episode two, Jesus has this scene with Andrew uh, where they basically talk about how to process grief. And, you know, I get why that's there. And I think there's some value to it, but not for a second. Okay, I'm not putting this aside. Obviously, our Lord understands everything There's about no human right grief. There's no right and wrong with grief. <laughs> Psychological health and everything. But I don't really believe there would have been a huge conversation about it. But then later on, he has a similar conversation with Peter after after Rama has died. And Peter's you know, saying, how am I going to comfort Thomas? And, and Jesus says to Peter the line, um, you know how grief works. <laughs> then, <laughs> he has I don't know. It's just – it's. It's yeah, it's like the it's very, very, very it's very kinda it's very therapeutic culture, yeah. you know, speak, yeah. which yeah. I think there's a place for acknowledging, you know, obviously Christ came to heal us and to bring us into the fullness of, of that healing, but definitely it's anachronistic. Yes, um, exactly. And this is this is something that some that degree, so. has been present to some extent from season one, from the beginning, okay? But I've been willing to live with it. Specifically, this 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 tonal anachronism, mm. uh, anachronicity, um, it's been present, but like so many of my criticisms at this point, it's like it's just getting a little tiresome, and it's 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 um, it's like I'm not getting enough payoff for for what is being sacrificed. Well, right? it's it's especially noticeable in those lines where Jesus says something that he says in the gospel, and then he like explains it for like four. The Martha and Mary scene. All yeah. the polite, the, the, he's so polite all yes. the time. He's so like know, yeah. walking on eggshells to not hurt that. anyone's feelings. Jesus yes. clearly hurts people's feelings in the gospels and not yeah. just the Pharisees. Like yeah, that, and, that's very frustrating to me. And it's often how he gets their attention he because qualifies he tells things. them he something that in stings. in the show. Yeah. 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 Well, so, so an example of how the anachron the, the language, and again, I'm, I'm not saying the show has to be all in convincing, uh, dialogue, no, no. but, but, but so for example, uh, right before he raises Lazarus, he says to Mary, I think, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? And then he says, your only priority in this moment, I can't, I can't do it. Your only priority in this moment is faith or something like that. And just like he uses the word priority. Like I feel like he's said the word priority at least like five times in these four seasons so far. And it's just, priority just doesn't work. There is again, it's not about like having it all sound archaic or something, but like there's certain words that like would never be appropriate. Like in a translation of the Bible, yeah. You know what I mean? Jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Jobs. <laughs> like the, you know, and, and and some of those words are just so modern sounding or something that in their, or at least in the context that they're used, that they, they, they're just, they're particularly glaring. You should at least avoid the words that like stick out like a sore thumb is basically what I'm saying. I'm not yeah. saying it all has to be <clears throat> super like authentic or something like but that. At least you know, there weren't any too soon jokes this season. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, like the, 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 like for me, that's the job. Like whenever so many times, every, so many times I've lost track, uh, character will talk about their job, you know, or like getting fired yeah. or, you know, I have one job completely <laughs> yeah. always throws me out. I'm just like, jobs do not exist. Like I yeah. know, or, you know, it's, it's wait, like, it's wait, just, what? jobs in the sense of like middle-class 20th century values which is okay. how they're they're usually talking about it in the show uh, right. at least that's my yeah and it's and so 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 what what i the way that i've chosen to describe this is is just as a tonal thing you know it's like you can point to these discrete moments like a particular word used here or a phrase used there um but it's there's like this this sense of um anachronism that's pervasive throughout so that it makes it very difficult for me to actually buy in increasingly difficult i should say to buy into the circumstances of this world that's being built now again like at the at the outset in season 1 i was willing to kind of live with this because i thought okay let's let's see what they're going to do with this maybe you I, I i'm not looking for a documentary i don't need it to adhere religiously to precise historical um you know details and minutia but uh if you're going to make these sacrifices if you're going to break something 
First, please like acknowledge that you are losing something. You're gonna break a dish. Yeah, well, <laughs> then, <laughs> you know, you, but you don't like like Make acknowledge that you you're, you are losing something. You are sacrificing something, and now what? What is it for? What to to what end? You know. So what do we gain in the exchange? So I think that whereas in season one, maybe we were at the outset, and so there was still the the promise, the possibility for things being developed in a particular way. It, increasingly, I'm feeling like, no, no, these, these strands are not being developed to an end that justifies this, this total flattening that's occurring. I mean, take, for example, the, the sort of uh, bro, like buddy, like nature of, of, of almost every scene that we get with the apostles. You know, there's this kind of, this this total lack of sobriety that and not literally it's not like they're getting drunk but there's this this kind of um uh 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 trivial triviality this 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 the, it's like a bunch of bros that that is totally not becoming or inspiring or or suggestive to me of what makes these guys special now sometimes sometimes we get a hint of that uh, coming from you. You mentioned uh, Z Simon the Zealot, you know. And I think maybe that's just manifested more easily in this character that they've decided to build for him, being this kind of bodyguard, this kind of de facto bodyguard for Jesus. He has to be a little more serious. Yeah. But, but, you know, these these men would go on to be serious saints. I mean, like the saints, <laughs> you know. And and uh, these are the men that are hand picked by Jesus. I get it. I get it that they had their foibles and that there's plenty of evidence for that within the gospels and that is why it's interesting to see those foibles maybe expressed. But but do I am I going to get like a single moment of of just even like having a a a glimmer of what these men will become, you know? Um not not yet, you know, unless it's in some sort of flash forward where we get like an aged uh, St. Matthew. You know, well, I mean, up. it's interesting, too, that like in in imagination, we, we visualize St. Peter is often depicted as being older. Right. For instance. And, and they're all kind of the same age in this show, more or less. I know there's very vari there's variation, but not really. Um, and that that might have something to do with it, too. It's like there's not like some older characters who bring a different kind of energy to it or yeah. something like that. They, I mean, historically, they probably would have been younger than we tend to depict them. Often the depictions that we're handed in the tradition is the apostles now as the ones establishing yeah. churches, not so well, much the apostles as they looked. But, I, during but the there's history. probably just a different sense of masculinity then too, of like sure. masculine seriousness. Right. You mm -hmm. know. And there's also, but it, it, it seems to run at cross purposes with some of the other kind of uh, dram dr dramaturgical instincts that are present in the film, because in other respects, there is this real attention to a kind of histori historicity. So even in just the decision to cast them all younger, you know, the, to, the, the decision to cast them all of a particular kind of ethnicity or, 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 or sort of vague uh, sense of, 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 you know, ethnic belonging to this region. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the decision to have them all, uh, speaking in an accent, you know, um, uh, these are all gestures toward a kind of, um, yeah, historical realism that I think gets totally lost in the tone of where the where the interactions are living, where the scenes are living, you know, how these guys are interacting with each other and, and, and speaking to each other. Um, so that there's this kind of dissonance that's created when you have these these creative choices that are being made that are pointing to one end and then these other choices that are kind of frustrating that yeah um yeah. it's it's it 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 ends up having the the effect for me of reinforcing that i am watching an elaborate cosplay like like reinforcing that i'm watching a show and 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 so it, it's constantly taking me out, you know. Um, I have a pretty I've been I have a I think a pretty sturdy theory that might explain some of this. 
from from an evangelical lens. And I say this as someone who who was formerly evangelical before I was Catholic. Um, and so, you know, with uh, respect to our evangelical listeners, if we have any, <laughs> uh, you know, if if you disagree with my interpretation of of this, uh, feel free to like leave a comment or something because we'd love to hear it. But my sense, and I've been seeing this over the four seasons, is uh, one. I think it's important to to realize, obviously, the the genesis of the show, as it's 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 like it's like a, as if um, you know, passion plays in the Catholic Church leaped onto the screen, you know, kind of from being a passion play. Like the genesis of this show is is like you know, Dallas Jenkins was doing these these sort of dramatic restagings for his his church community, um, and then of course it morphs into this show but i think i think it's it, so there's kind of like a pantomime like purpose like that's kind of the roots and part of that i think especially in a uh, you know mega church or like mainstream evangelical kind of culture is it's the most important thing is relatability you know because the only thing you have are the are is scripture in order to really bring you close to the experience of what's happening in the gospels you don't have the benefit of tradition um and you don't have the sacraments either to really bring you that sense of personal closeness and relationship. So everything is about trying to capture this mental, uh, it boost your mental image basically of like what a relationship with Christ is supposed to be. Um, and obviously the only things that are allowed to really, really, you know, unimpeachably present that image are what's found in scripture. Um, and so I think, I think that's, that's the starting point. And then of course, obviously as, as, as the show is taking off and as they're realizing the creative potential, they're, they're seeing the benefits of filling in the gaps and, 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 you know, basically like kind of hewing more towards a a more um, historically uh, Catholic kind of approach to, to understanding these things, but they don't really have um, the evangelical mindset, in my opinion, doesn't have, it, it, you know, it doesn't have the, uh, I don't want to say the DNA, but it has, it, it doesn't have what it needs in order to really kind of make that, that leap. So they're kind of trying to make that leap in ways that are, again, anachronistic, as we've been saying, they're trying to connect with kind of what the experience that, that they have, or we have, as we know it, um, is reaching out in order to, to grasp what's happening in the story. And so that's how you end up with a character like Rama who um, starts out as like a kind of a functional to this sort of like s- story, overarching story around the the unimpeachable core story that we know is true. Um, you know, she's there to provide this kind of fleshing out of the the women, you know, and she can live in that mode quite happily, I think, uh, in terms of story function until that point when they decide, you know what, actually we need, we need to bring her in as a romantic interest. And I know she's kind of set up from the beginning as a, as a romantic interest, but she doesn't really function that way until, you know, we get to like season three, season four. At this point, my, my, what I think about, I think that comes to the fore partly because that's a very common experience for the evangelical audience. So, you know, the vast majority of the audience watching it is, you know, probably married or wanting to be married. Uh, and so that's a very, very relatable, common thing, you know, as it is for, for non-evangelical viewers too. But yeah. that's kind of like, you know, for a Catholic viewer, there's much, many more points of entry to connect to with the symbols, the sacraments, um, tr- what yeah. holy tradition, you know, what we know from that. For, for an evangelical audience, it's kind, they don't have that. And so this is the point of access. A character like Rama is really functioning as this kind of symbolic entry point for a whole modern Mm -hmm. audience that doesn't otherwise have means to really like psychologically and even spiritually try to put themselves like into this experience. So they're, they're trying to bring that relatability and, and, you know, to the audience and they have to do it with like modern 20th century ways of doing it. Um, It's the same thing with Zebedee's, I don't want to call it a midlife crisis because it's not, but it's like, you know, Zebedee uh, went from being like this incredibly, you know, th- you know, kind of rugged, masculine, you know, like awesome, just dad, father figure. And then as they start to flesh him out, I hate to say it, but he gets less interesting as yeah. they made him more of an actual character. And yeah. now he's in this whole like, hey, I got my oil business. Like <laughs> it's 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 very much like a sitcom kind of, um, you know, hey, dad's got his project. Like, ha 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 ha. Like, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of cool too. Um but it's like, you know, 
who's changing careers in in first century you know Judea right, like right, right. Yeah. like it's, it's completely ridiculous yeah. and, you know um, but that's the thing they're, 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 that's what the audience knows the every, you know it's a middle class audience for the most part I would say that you know that would be a normal part of kind of the middle class American experience is like hey these things change you might have to change careers so I think there's like a certain aspect there like I think we have to acknowledge that there is a there's a canniness there that is praiseworthy in terms of um, you know trying to connect with the audience and even if we take a historical view and look at other depictions in art throughout the history of Christianity you know, we see the same thing in, in various periods, uh, you know, of, of painting, especially, you know, the Renaissance and, you know, it, you know, basically yeah. painters projecting their own uh, situation in terms of the accidents of things, uh, objects and clothes and all that uh, in order to try to bring the, the gospel into the present day in a way that the viewer, you know, can kind of connect easily with it. It's the same thing happening here. And I'll just tie this thought off with this. The question is, why does this go off the rails? Um, and I would say that it goes off the rails with, with Rayma's character, uh, where, you know, the essentially that becomes the plot. Like, it's yeah. not just simply shading. It's not just simply texture, uh, not just an access point, but that becomes the story. Like, Thomas and Rayma becomes the the story of the first three episodes, basically, to the point where what happens at that story is now going to determine basically the rest of the yeah, show. Yeah. It, like it's very much a turning point because we can see the way it affects Thomas, the way that affects the rest of the, the disciples. Um, right. Even with the good intention, you know, I assume the intention is, Hey, this is going to make Thomas's doubting and his coming to believe his uh, proclamation to belief after the resurrection. This is going to make that all the, that much more better. You know, I'm sure that's the intention is, now that we have this sense of why he was maybe why he was doubting, it's going to make his proclamation all the more powerful. But I think what we see instead is, um, you it's know, it's reductive. The, it's reductive. The right. inventing aspect. It's it's veering off. It's yeah, it's uh, right. it's no longer adding you know texture. It's now right creating a whole new branch basically. So, so Rama is not just color for Thomas. She becomes color for the entire story. And like she sort of is become so important as a part of Thomas that she pulls him out yeah, of the and main it's, story and of it's the gospel. It's constraining, it's delimiting, you know. So in the same mm -hmm. way that I sort of took issue with Martha's whole character seemingly being about her 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 fussiness over the house, it's like increasingly this comes to dominate Thomas's character. Right. And it's gonna dominate his doubting, you know, and so it's going to dominate my ability to sort of see reflected in that a multiplicity of experiences, you mm, know, and reasons yeah, for doubt. Right, right. I mean, the, these gospel passages, right. They, they're recorded for a reason and That's they're the recorded thing. in their yeah. simplicity for a reason, you know, and, and, and so we, I think that again, like you have to be yeah. so aware of what it is that you're losing, what it is that you're breaking and then perhaps what it is that you're gaining in exchange. Yeah. And I think that... And this is one of the perils of this entire project. Yes. Of like the very idea of doing a... A movie is one thing, but like a seven a seven season series. Right, right. That's 70 hours. Right. Or, yeah, you know, whatever, times eight, not times 10, but, you know. Well, and I, um, I think that maybe in another world, you spend a little less time developing these subplots and you spend a little more time digging more even more into the scriptures even more into you know these moments with the with the disciples um you know there's so much that we haven't seen and that we're not going to see yeah. because we're, now here we are at the outset of holy week you know right. and well, so and the the sequencing of events is all kind of twisted up at this point yes because yes, it, that's it, frustrating it, also yeah because we have john the baptist seemingly dying very close to holy week when in reality in the gospels he dies well, not all of them record. John doesn't record anything about John's uh, John's death, but um, Luke kind of mentions it in passing as Herod kind of remembers that he beheaded John the Baptist. We don't actually get the description, but Matthew and Mark describe it, and they both describe it um, as something that happens early on in Jesus's ministry, and it's actually the catalyst for the first multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Um, and in fact, Jesus's reaction to it is a little different. Right? I mean, in the show, he's kind of like, you know, at this like kind of camp site by himself and sobbing on the ground and all this. But um, 
uh, in the in the Gospels, what we get is it says that he um, withdraws and goes off on a boat by himself to get away from everyone. Um, and by the time he gets to the next shore, a crowd has heard he's done this. And so the crowd is waiting for him and he takes compassion on them, starts to heal them. And he's kind of doing this for a long time, it's implied. And then, you know, then we get the whole thing where like, oh, they're hungry. We can't send them away. And he multiplies the loaves for the first time. So it sort of shows Jesus trying to process his grief, trying to get away for a private moment um, after his cousin has been killed. And then, but he has this job to do and he cannot stray from the mission. That's the way the gospel is presented to us. Here, you know, the timeline is very, with the multiplication is long in the past. And, you know, the backdrop for that was Peter's whole, yeah. you know, miscarriage thing yeah. um, rather than, than John. Um, so it's just, it's very strange um, how they've kind of uh, jostled these things about. Yeah. But I, yeah. just to, to kind of bring in this point also, one thing I've really missed in this season is, um, and I feel like as the show progressed, this should have been highlighted more and more. Uh, but in season one, it starts off rather starkly with um, Mary Magdalene's possession, right? And there's yes, kind of a right. big focus. I was thinking on that. about this too. Sorry, yeah. Keep going. The, the, the big focus on the powers of darkness. I mean, yes. in the Gospels, and especially, of course, in Mark, famously, and John. Um, you know, those are huge themes. Jesus is battling against the powers of darkness, and they are behind everything that's happening, behind all the human authorities that are that are opposing him. And here in the show, it feels like that's lost. Um, totally. It, and it was it, it was there, which is why it's frustrating that it's lost. If it hadn't been absent from the beginning and they just wanted to focus on the human drama and the little you know jokes and these things from the get-go, that would have been fine from a certain perspective. But because they managed to capture that well in the beginning, and we even got some of that into season two. We have Magdalene, I think it was in season two that she's kind of struggling again, with yeah. what she stepped away from. Um, but here, I mean, and and the Caesarea Philippi would have been the perfect place to kind of bring this emphasis back in, totally. because and and actually that's one of the reasons that that scene fell quite flat for me because they're talking the apostles are talking about like this this terrible place, and nothing about the cinematography, the camera work, anything suggests anything sinister. Like it just yeah. looks like a place where you know happy Gentiles are like uh, having a little <laughs> festival, and they're like, oh, are they going to sacrifice? Like, oh no, something worse, and we don't know what the worst would be. And I don't, again, I don't want them to explain everything, but it could have been suggested. This yeah. is a sinister place. I mean, historically, this was a place where uh, an apostate king had set up worship to Baal, which uh, in the eyes of the Jews was synonymous with the devil. Um, there had been worship of the god Pan, you know, this god of uh, orgies and insanity and all this stuff. Um, and... Um, and it was seen to be the gates of hell. And I mean, they kind of, they touch on the gates of hell thing. But again, nothing about it sets it up as Jesus is kind of putting the dark powers on notice. Well, yeah, it, it's like a big whiff. It's like, a, like it's a place that smells bad. Yeah. 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 And they have I mean, this line, it's a like, place ah, where Gentiles are doing things they shouldn't be doing. But that's that's the gates of hell. Uh, like, it, know, I mean, like, in, in the Jewish imagination, this was a place that was literally like haunted. This was like yeah. the place where the, the souls of the dead Nephilim, like the, the great giants of old and all of this were, you know, roaming. Wow. Um, like this was like, this was this, the place of the, the netherworld, like on earth. And that's just like completely missing here. Yeah. Um, I was totally noticing that with this season as well. Um, especially because of how Thomas begins behaving, mm -hmm. um, where someone really needs to rebuke him and, and say something like, get behind me, Satan, you know, right. like you're, 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 you're like listening to demons right now. Mm -hmm. And and yet there isn't. It's like we're we're handling him with kitty gloves. We're handling each yeah, other. Yeah, he just he just has to work it out on his own. We no. just have to leave him space. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, right. That's the attitude exactly. that's being taken. It's, we have to let him go through the leave, stages of let grief. Him, let him let him be, and he'll figure it out. He can't understand what I'm saying right now. Right. You know? Right. And I and I just think that you know, uh, that I know that there are people in my life who would not allow that you know and rightly so because they love me you know mm -hmm. and they they would they would rebuke me challenge mm -hmm. me you know and just to, to to see not just the other apostles not doing that but but jesus himself not doing that you know was very like disedifying for me yeah. and uh and and was another 
like it was specifically that that made me think, oh yeah, there's been no mention of of demons or of the devil. You know, mm-hmm. this might be a good time for that. Um, yeah. Well, so. uh, Judas is going to have to have a a demon enter into him, right? Yeah. Well, that. The, the, we'll there was like a, that. there was well there was like an allusion to it when when Judas was oh, right. was giving them his idea about something and then he says maybe maybe Thomas isn't one of the true sheep and yeah. one of the other apostles Philip. says yeah. has a devil gotten into you uh, what's wrong oh, with you yeah. or something you know I missed that I well, do remember that line I just Philip didn't didn't that, think of it yeah. in and that it, way and it just makes me wonder if maybe that's that's their they're referencing this huh. this <laughs> moment. And now, yeah. now we're not going to get it, you know. Yeah. Um, well, we'll see. But, but they yeah, are we'll, spending we'll, an they are spending an entire episode on Holy Week, so they better it's an entire season. Entire season. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, an entire season. Listen, they, they I don't better give us every detail. I don't Holy think Week it's for want of of material. You know, I think that there's plenty of material to sustain a seven season uh, show about you know Jesus's public life and and perhaps maybe a season for for afterward you know but but yeah. well, part, part, this Go is ahead. a good point to bring up actually i think something that that is probably on a practical level is is the, the reason why season four feels kind of both too fast and too slow um which is that dallas jenkins has been very vocal about his desire to make season six the entirety of season six the crucifixion which presumably i don't know how i don't know how he's going to do that but i assume, i think it's a very interesting idea i assume that's going to mean a lot of flashbacks similar to like scenes what we see in the passion of the christ when there's like the flash yeah. back to the last supper and stuff like that i don't know how jenkins is going to do it but i assume it's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of material perhaps that we have at least i hope a lot of material that we haven't seen yeah that should be in the lead up to holy week will hopefully be there um, but my sense is that, uh, because season five has to be all Holy week and that's, that's a very appropriate decision in my opinion. And season six has to be all crucifixion. That means that we only have one season to basically cover all this ground. And you can definitely see how season four, you know, is, is, is rushing to yeah. cover all that ground yeah. at the same time that it's, um, it's just so lopsided in, in a lot of ways. Mm. And such to the point that the, the main plot of season four is, episodes one to three is Thomas and Rama basically. And then the effects that that has. And then kind of from that point, the back half of the season is very much Judas, like in terms of like main development, you know, it's, yeah. it's they're, they're rushing through. Like one thing I love about how they introduced Judas in season two was um, season two and three was he's a likable guy. Like, yeah, I like this guy. He seems like a really decent fellow, you know, and he really sincere. And I was really looking forward to seeing how are they going to show that turn and show the corruption and then like how, how corruption can happen so subtly. And I feel like there was a missed opportunity yeah, here where, where basically because they have to cover all this ground. Now they're, you know, they're not doing it super fast, but they are, there's definitely a sharp turn where it's like, oh, okay, now we're, now we're in the Judas is corrupting, you know, arc. Like there was, there was a shift there that we didn't get to see. And I think mm. it's, you know, so, so that's part of it is like the ambitions for the show, which are pretty incredible, I think are, are kind of putting season four in this, uh, uh lopsided, like redheaded stepchild kind of position yeah, well, where it has to carry all this weight yeah. that it really can't But if carry. we had just, if we had done away with this stupid romance subplot and just spent more time with the apostles, more time with, with these interactions, like the ones that emerge between Matthew and Peter, like, why is it that that's the only, like, apostle to apostle relationship that's really been fleshed out or given any sort of, like, substance? You know, like, there's, it's, you've got 12 people. You can do it. You know, you don't need all these other things being imported. And so, like, I, I agree with you that I think that there was a missed opportunity with Judas because I also was interested. Oh, yeah. What are they going to do with, with, with Judas? He, he's super likable. He's super nice. Like, there's a lot of opportunity here to have this slow burn and like cook a personal relationship with Jesus and how that could sour. You know, remember I mean, how Judas was like the first time after, after the sermon and like that, like pan past yeah, the apostles. That was Judas, awesome. Like, yeah. That was super cool. Yeah. You know? Um, but, uh, but, but no, you know, instead basically he just goes and like sees his old boss and now we're off to the races. Like now every interaction is 
Judas doesn't get it. Judas is all about the money. Judas is about like the the military messiah. And it's like, ah, man, like this. I, I OK, I've seen this before, right. you know, um, but uh, but, you know, if 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 there could have been maybe a rebuke, you know, maybe it's not Thomas that gets fatalistic and despairing. Maybe it's Judas and it's not everybody handling him with kitty gloves and giving him time. Maybe it's something that's a correction that's not received well, you know, like I'm just spitballing here. But but these are possibilities that that now aren't going to be able to be realized, you know, and what we've gotten extent instead is something that's pretty, again, like flat. Um, so we've talked about the romance subplot and we've talked about the aftermath of Rama's death and how it affects the rest of the season. We haven't actually really talked about her death and you said it was the most boring way they could have done it but i don't think we ever actually explained well i wasn't really sp means. speaking about the death i was just talking about like this is the way that we resolve this romantic I tension see, i see okay. because we we all knew that something was going to have to give unless they were going to get married and like go off and like found the church okay. in india together um <laughs> right but uh but um uh but no, yeah, it was it was also super dumb the way that she died. Right. I was so can we talk about can we talk about episode? <laughs> it was very. Can contract. we talk about episode three? Because I've been we've been sort of revving up to it, but not yeah, haven't gotten to it yet. So let's think about in, in terms of, you know, okay, so we have this fictional character. She, her death is going to have an impact on these real characters. You know, um, how are we going to knit these things together? And the way in which the the show goes about it is it the only way that it, that it can have. The only way that can happen, the way the show does it, is if every character involved in that situation makes the absolute, the most um, irrational, kind of unexplainable decision in the moment, <laughs> right, right, which leads to her death, and that's so that that includes um, including Thomas, Jesus, including Jesus, which is the worst thing about it, you know. Um, so, you know, we have this kind of riot starting Jesus is, you know, pre he's preaching, he's, um, telling the Pharisees off in front of the synagogue in Capernaum, uh, crowd is forming. He's just healed the man born blind. I have, I, I hope we can talk about the man born blind. Cause I do, <laughs> I do have thoughts about that. Um, but anyway, he's just healed the man born blind. Uh, situation's getting tense. The Romans are coming in to see what's happening. Uh, and, all of a sudden there's this escalation. Someone gets shoved. Now we're in full on kind of like there's a riot forming. Uh, Thomas goes in to try to find Rama. Uh, and there's meanwhile, guy, um, not guys, the, uh, the Quintus. praetor Quintus. Um, Quintus. Thank you. Cause he's uh, he's mad about everything. Uh, about it. And so he's ready. To, oh my God. He, so... yeah, he's a kettle waiting to go. <laughs> um, and so uh... once he pulls his sword in order to kind of like, you know, quell the crowd who's pressing around him. Thomas. So Thomas makes the decision in character to <laughs> in character. take Rama by the hand to rescue her, to try to get her out of the crowd by walking directly past the guy, the, the Roman, the, the Roman governor who who's hates yelling at him to everybody stop. with a sword. Who's, who's brandishing probably the most the psychotic, sword, the most psychotic you know, person in the city. Erratically. Um, he walks right past him. Yeah. Like he's not him. there. <laughs> bump, bumps him. And then obviously, okay. So that's, that's the one thing. Quintus, for whatever reason, I guess the assumption, I guess the idea is that he's so blind with rage that he's just, he's stabbing the first thing he sees. It, you know, he's like, you know what? I'm going to kill this girl. Like, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm done. I've hit my point. I'm, I'm going to kill this girl. Uh, it, it just, <laughs> It, none of it makes any sense on a on a yeah. story character level. Ugh. You know, it's it's so it, it's an event that can only happen if everybody makes the absolute worst decision possible. Yes. And when you have that in drama, it never works. Yeah. Like no. it's not gonna, it has to be, you know, even just one of, if one of those things was changed, I could see it maybe. I still wouldn't like it. I still wouldn't, you know, but but at least if something was convincing about characters' motivations, then you could get away with it. But it's not the case here. It's it's right. you can feel the it basically you feel the hand of the maker. Yeah. This is how it has to go, and it's just it's just very very yeah. Well, and it was super telegraphed. It. You know, it was super telegraphed um, because I think there were like a solid, you know, 
almost 30 seconds before she actually dies where I was thinking in my heart, no, no, this can't. And not because I felt attached to, to Rayma, because, but because I just thought, no, this, this cannot be, this is so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, and also and, it felt like a nineties film where it's like, you know, someone is like, Oh, watch your little brother. And you know, they like Mary Magdalene, she was the word that triggered. You had one job and the job was to watch Rayma. I think Tamar yeah. was also, you know, they're both like, Oh, watch her. Like she's a child. Um, and, <laughs> and of course yeah. Rayma wanders off as children yeah. in nineties films always do. <laughs> and, you know, the siblings are like, oh, we were distracted. Um, you know, it's just like everything about it was just so contrived and stupid. Yeah. And Jesus is also he's preaching to a crowd that isn't listening to him. That's like rioting. But he's yeah. like continuing to just like stand there talking. But like it's just drowned out. And like, why would he do that? And, and also like the, the way it's set up is like this provo- this deliberate provocation like of the Pharisees, like there's a line earlier you can't hear you can't heal on shabbat and jesus says that'll make it more this more fun which is like totally not like in the spirit of christ at all it seems like the entire point of the riot is so that rainbow will get killed and like why is jesus doing this and then he leaves and like a lot is made of like why is jesus not raising her from from the dead but it feels kind of arbitrary we've already got this question has already been asked in the show and answered in the show. And there's a lot of weight put on his thought. God's thoughts are greater than our thoughts, but because the entire, like this isn't God's thoughts, this is like Dallas Jenkins and Coda's yes, thoughts. Right. So That's like, what's bothersome. so it doesn't feel yeah. necessary. It's, it's not played as a martyrdom either. It's played as a random tragedy. Yeah. Um, but like I, there was a Reddit comment, which I appreciated, which he said, Rayma's death makes Jesus look weak and his power arbitrary in a moment where his followers should be rejoicing because the bridegroom is with them. This speaks to your point, Josh, about people being mopey all the time. And he he continues, if Rayma had died any other way, I might have bought it. But the fact that she was murdered for Jesus and then he didn't save her, it's like the groom allowing guests to die at his own wedding. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And again, she's not a martyr per se, and I don't think the show wants us to think that. It's supposed to be more of a random, but it, senseless it, it reflects, act. But it reflects on Jesus, just as it reflects on Thomas, who leads her recklessly right into her death, yeah. you know? It reflects on Jesus, too, for having been the leader of this group, you know, who goes there and then instigates a riot, and then one of his followers is killed, you know? And it puts, the, it puts Jesus in a weird position where he now has to has to answer to to Thomas for for, for what's he going to do is he going to heal her is he going to save her raise her from the dead what what you know and that really bothers me because now what we're getting is the show writers sort of putting words into Jesus's mouth this isn't fleshing out something this isn't filling in some blank spaces this is creating something whole cloth and attributing it to Jesus and and that I'm sorry like I think that's a little too much you know mm-hmm. um uh well especially after he was like talking about the wedding gift that you know and like saying he would officiate for them it's like yeah. did you not know that you know a moment later he's gonna be well dead? if if you go back and look at the scene where they ask him to do that uh, on the way to Caesarea Philippi you yeah. see that the Rumi plays it as like he knows what's going to happen. That's probably why he's so filled with yeah. grief. I think the first time you see that, you're like, oh, you don't know why he's kind of upset. You know, obviously yeah. on, on the second viewing, it's very clear. Like he's, you know. You can see I, that I, in, in yeah. his performance, but I think the script doesn't serve that purpose because like he mm-hmm. does, he basically, you know, tells them like, oh, you know, have you thought about what gift you're going to get? Like, you know, yeah, he, right, even right. giving him that line doesn't make sense with right. the emotion that Rumi... I think rightly yeah, tries to the, bring to it. Like I think Rumi's, there's the joke where I mean, you know P- Peter has to take him aside and like set him straight, and and Jesus kind of like gives a wink and a nod to that too. Yeah, I, I think it's probably good to acknowledge at this point. I mean, at least from my perspective, I think all the actors, no matter what they were given with the script, have tended to do a great job at least this season. Um, yeah. You know, even like Thomas, as much as like I found that his storyline irritating, like I thought did a really good job of portraying his grief. Um, yeah. Just yep. to, you know, be kind to the actors that have clearly yeah, like, yeah, tried enough. really hard. Um, and I, I think succeeded in giving it a good performance, even when the material they were working with was not a, not optimal. But with the, with the Thomas thing once more, I think part of the reason they introduced this, 
like death of Rama thing and made such a big deal out of it was again to kind of try to do what I think they did well in season one and, and, you know, earlier as well and later on uh, in the show, it says in John's gospel, chapter 11, um, after Jesus, you know, it, they had tried to stone him. He gets the news that Lazarus is dead, just as it happens in the show. Um, and uh, in verse 16 of chapter 11, it says, um, or I'll, I'll, just before that, Jesus says, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And it says, so Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That line is in the show, but when you hear Thomas say it in the show, it reads very differently. Here, mm. it sounds like Thomas is, it's highlighting his incredible fidelity to Jesus. He's just so loyal that even though he doesn't believe that Jesus is going to survive this, which from a Jewish perspective, you know, like the Messiah doesn't die. Um, so he somehow, he doesn't quite have the faith to believe that Jesus is going to manage whatever his mission is. But he's so loyal to Jesus. The loyalty together with the lack of faith are being highlighted. Where in the show, it's, a, it's you know, a statement of like bitterness. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's a very different emotion. So I feel like they've they've kept the line, but the meaning behind the line has been altered. One other thing kind of along that line, and again, it, it, the, the main point I'm making here is just that they are no longer kind of succeeding at embellishing well the details that are in the Gospels, along with like the emotional content of them. Martha has a development in this Gospel. Um, in so far as like, we all kind of know the Martha Mary thing, you know, Mary's sitting at Jesus feet, Martha's working, you know, that's elaborated on extensively in the, in the, in the season. But, um, when Jesus comes, uh, after the death of Lazarus, you see that she's learned something from that previous moment. And the way it describes it, um, is it says, uh, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him but Mary remained seated in the house. So it's kind of suggesting there's a bit of a, bit of a flip there. Mary yeah. now is the one that doesn't quite have the, the, the faith to go to Jesus, um, but Martha does. And in fact, it says uh, afterwards that Martha goes and brings Mary to Jesus. Um, so it's uh, that, but that, that kind of aspect of, and, and if you read like Mary's, uh, Martha's lines rather, which are in the show, Again, they, they kind of read differently because in the gospel, um, you know, she, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. That's all there. But the emotion behind it is different. Here we have a Martha who is now completely confident in Jesus and who he is and what he can do, um, despite the fact that she's stricken with grief. In the show, we get like the principal emotion first. You do get some of that faith, but the principal emotion is Martha's anger and frustration that Jesus didn't yeah. come when they called him. So it's, it's substituting a different emotion for what the gospel is putting forward rather yeah. than filling it out for us. Yeah. Um, and if and I can that's jump where in I kind of get frustrated with what they're doing now. Yeah. And, and if I can jump in on that point that you just mentioned about Thomas saying, let us go with him that we may die with him. Um, just to look at it from, uh, from the point of view of exegesis, like, okay, so why is that in the, in the gospel? Well, like it can't be that that was put in the gospel, but it requires like something that's not mentioned at all in the gospel in order to understand that line. Like yeah. it was put in there and we can understand it by reading the gospel. Right. Right. But like, if you were just trying to do exegesis of that line in the gospel, you would never imagine that it was because of something like what happens in the show. And you would never read, you wouldn't, you just wouldn't read it that way. Yeah, I think. And and so the fact that they've invented something that in how what they've in, they've made in, in the story that they've invented is a plausible uh, reason for him to say that. But just simply based on reading the gospel is not a plausible reading, uh, it seems to me, that is really more going contrary to the gospel. Yeah. Because they've interpreted the line, the line in a way that is not just fleshing out what it means, but it only makes sense according to the backstory that yeah. they've created. Yeah, yeah, and this is yeah. necessarily a reduction. You know, right. there's a there's a right. 
Right. And, uh, and impoverishment. Think, yeah. Yeah. I think similar to what we were saying earlier about um, kind of the, the, the show as a grappling to, ha- you know, it's a, it's an attempt to kind of reach out to deepen connection to Christ um, from an evangelical kind of starting point. I think this is, you really kind of see this, the same dynamic being played out to the full where they're dealing with the problem of suffering. I think again, in season, yeah, season three, like the, the Peter Eden subplot really kind of brought this to the fore, but I think this is kind of what really, when the show is all said and done, I think this is kind of going to be the, the real soul of it in a way as a unique kind of interpretation of the gospels um, in that, there's this grappling towards understanding. Like they, they basically put Thomas into this kind of like in a position analogous to the priest in silence, you know, where they're, they're kind of giving him this impossible task of faith where it's, it's like, would you still love the Lord? Even if he seemed like he was your, he was your greatest enemy, you know, or that he was imposing like a burden of faith that seems impossible to actually fulfill. Um, that's kind of where this is going, you know, like that, that's, that's the question being grappled with here. Um, and I think it's significant that the show is doing it. I don't think they're doing it well to be clear, but I think the reason they are doing it is because again, this is an, uh, a desacramentalized understanding of Christianity. Yeah. So the normal means of going to the Lord and understanding and asking and, and doing that grappling, that wrestling isn't available the way it is to, you know, to us. Um, and so this is their, this is an attempt to do that. Hmm. Um, the problem is that, you know, it's, it's doing it in a way that is because it's, it's unmoored really from, from the anchor of, you know, what the, the Holy Catholic church is. Um, I think you can see that. I think you see the effects of that and how this is playing out. You know, well, I don't know. That's it's like James in our season three discussion was talking about how he didn't like how everybody's kind of getting into each other's business. And that felt like kind of a Protestant thing to him. Whereas he liked when uh, Eden, Peter's wife goes to um, the, the rabbi or whoever his name is. And, and uh, he prescribes like praying this Psalm because that felt like a more of a kind of like a ritual mm-hmm. a set form of words, you know, that felt more, common to our catholic experience yeah hmm. um that like you have these resources that are not just yeah. sort of like flailing around in your subjectivity right um <laughs> you know right you know so we talked about this tendency to explain everything yeah. um so you know there's a lot of kind of like clunky exposition of jewish practices you know mm. in this regard but then also anytime like uh jesus says something that's maybe a little confusing um it's couched it's almost like it's bookended with the kinds of trite explanations that you would expect to see in like the lowest common denominator like religious education pamphlet you know um uh and and then similarly in just interactions among characters there's this tendency more often than not for like a constant telegraphing of like what my my response is to this thing that you're saying or 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 um how I'm feeling about this particular situation such that you know it it becomes just a little too too busy and a little too noisy and that there's not enough space for for things to kind of reverberate and echo mm-hmm. a little bit yeah. um and for me to have my own response to particular moments right. um and uh and I'll, I'll say that not everybody is this way um but it is so uniform that you almost get the impression that this is this is a directorial thing so this isn't necessarily a problem with particular performers so much as it is i think kind of an impulse that's being given from from the show you know as a whole. But you had something you were saying about like word emphasis and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Right, that's that a little point. bit of a separate point, but, oh, okay. um, but I, I, you know, I, I think that there are, there are a lot of plenty of instances where performers in an effort to try to convey a lot of subtext or a lot of like, you know, uh, have a lot of commentary about what, what this line means to them. Um, end up obfuscating actually the simple meaning of the text so that sometimes there is uh 
stress or emphasis placed on words that that actually shouldn't be emphasized if you're going to clarify the the meaning of what you're saying um but end up getting emphasized because of some sort of performative uh embellishment that's being like added as a gloss to like how i feel mm -hmm. about this this moment or whatever and w moments that are particularly egregious are when pronouns get emphasized sometimes this is necessary to highlight a dichotomy or an antithesis um well i wouldn't have done it that way you know that's fine but but uh but sometimes it's just at the disservice of the line um nouns and yeah, verbs a lot of times yeah a lot of yeah. times it's 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 <laughs> It's a lot of times it's verbs, yeah. yeah. Nouns, <laughs> but um, <and> verbs. <laughs> but uh, but but no, but no, but uh, in in other uh, watch watch it back, and you'll notice that there's a lot of emphasis of pronouns and also a lot of emphasis of prepositions. Mm. So like before or or you know, like. <laughs> oh, you mean when you and James asked this? It's his left and right hand. Yes. Yeah. You see, we asked for what we wanted based on our own understanding, our own ambitions, based on our own understanding, our own ambitions. He was not happy. Not just he wasn't happy, he was heartbroken at how little we understood, how little we understood, how little we understood. You believe I'm doing this from a lack of understanding? Well, it is your idea. Hmm? Does he not want us to be creative? To think critically, to use the gifts Adonai gave us to serve him? Look, I've been here since before he announced who he is, and there's still so much I don't understand. I'm not presuming. I'm seeking to understand. Can you remember the scene that twigged this for you? Like oh, there's so like, many that like this okay. was long. This has been a long standing problem. Um, and so, you know, yeah. it's it's been there since the beginning. But but one scene, uh, one line that comes up out as an example, and it's going to sound so trite, but you guys have to trust me that like in the long run, it, it builds up and it really does make for diminished understanding. But uh, when when Judas is talking with John, uh, about some difficulty that he's having and John is is you know trying to like I guess you know be helpful you know the last the last thing he says is 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 he suggests that Judas go ask Jesus so you know he says ask him and and Jesus isn't like off in the corner Je where Jesus he's like isn't pointing present. to him or something Jesus hasn't been mentioned you know Jesus yeah. isn't it's it's just we're just supposed to like infer i suppose that that <clears throat> that 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 well we know we know we know who him is you know the the him but no <laughs> ask him ask him okay that like that, the action yes yeah. that clarifies what what is being proposed you know and 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 it's again like it sounds trite but it, when you listen, yeah. if you go to that scene um, and watch it back, listen to everything that John is saying, and actually, it's kind of hard to follow because of what is being emphasized, what's 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 being chosen to be stressed. Okay, now this is not a point that I wanted to make, except that you asked me to make it. Okay, <laughs> but no, this the is really interesting. It's this it's is, it's a hard point yeah. to make, you know, yeah. on a podcast. I want to reduce the strain, the uncertainty around resources, so we can get back to work to building the kingdom that he is here to build. Look, Judas, I don't question your intentions. What do you think I should do, John? Ask him. I'm really glad you brought this up because, I, and again, I know it probably seems to maybe the, the average listener or viewer that this is nitpicking, but I think it's important that like when you get into this kind of fine grained analysis in terms of like why, you know, as an actor on set, how you make that intonation is everything, you know, yeah. that's your only job in that moment with that line is it's like, you have to do it the right way or the way that you're, you know, being directed and trusted the director is, is doing it the way that is best for, for the purpose of the scene. 
Um, and so these things really do matter. And I think it's interesting that even just that, that emphasis of like, ask him versus ask him one is much more of a punchy button rhythmically, like to the way the, it's much more American TV style in terms yeah. of, you know, okay, that's a, that's a, that's a, when I say button, like these are things that are kind of, again, it's hard to do this on a podcast, but like when you're editing, it's like, that's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, there's like a rhythmic kind of like oomph there that like, if I cut on that, that's going to carry the energy is going to kind of carry over into the next thing. Like that's a good and that thing. That is what on. it does. Cause it cuts. And then we see Jesus, you know, so and, that and, is and no how, doubt. It, how it functions. Yeah. And no doubt, like on set, that's probably what, uh, you know, Dallas Jenkins has in mind as he's directing, right. you know, th- like, and this is all, you know, this is all good, good filmmaking kind of just stuff. This is, this is how, it, how, how it happens. But it's interesting to think about how one option uh, opens up kind of like the life of that, dynamic and one is really the other is kind of geared more towards closing it in a i don't know like i'm not here to say one is better than the other but like you know one is definitely the, the one that they go with is definitely the one that's more s- conventional we might say for a, dr- a, a dramatic television show where it's all about kind of get to the next thing like get yeah to the point get to the next thing and, well and, and i will also say that it's dwelling. it's also sorry it's also just something that's that's very common in contemporary speech is that we do mm. tend very naturally to emphasize pronouns and to emphasize like descriptors. Um, so like, you know, that was just like very silly, um, you know, <laughs> so like very, <laughs> very that is not the that most example sucks, <laughs> <laughs> but like very is not the thing that's, 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 that's interesting or impactful, but like silly, I was very silly, you know, and like, and, um, and so when you, when you, when you hear it, honestly, like, listen at, uh, at mass. Okay. This is something that lectors are guilty of all the time is actually, you know, rendering a passage completely incomprehensible because everything that has been emphasized are like pron- pronouns and prepositions. And, and, and so the, the, the actual meaning of the lines are like, uh, I don't know what, like, what like, and on. we will enter into his glorious kingdom. Yeah. Right. It's part of the, um, what I would characterize as like a general kind of like busyness and a, a need mm. to like comment and give a gloss on everything that's said mm. rather than like really believing in like the power of just the words themselves, you know, mm-hmm. um, business I, is a, is a great way to put it. I think that's it's something that the earlier seasons, they, they, they had more, they, they let things just weren't as necessary or, or like, you know, in the sense of they, they could just sort of relax a bit. You know, I think that's the strength of the earlier seasons is like these moments could just relax. Even one example that doesn't involve words that comes to mind. I was talking about the oil press scene and I didn't mention, you know, earlier, but the way that that scene goes, you know, Gaius, the Roman centurion, who's, who's a uh, illegitimate son was healed, shows up out of the blue, completely out of the blue shows up at the end of that scene to comfort Jesus. And that's the kind of, th- you know, that's another example I would say of like busyness that it's not spoken busyness, but there's a kind of a narrative busyness. It's like, it's not enough that we yeah. can just be with the Lord and let him suffer. Right. Like, seeing his future like he knows what you know that's what obviously we can see what the press means but no like somebody has to come comfort him and then i guess there's an ironic element that it's a roman centurion comforting comforting him yeah but it's just so unnecessary it's so like you don't you don't need that you can just let us be with him just let the moment soak in Mm -hmm. and it also shrinks the world you know because it's like wait what's 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 gaius doing behind this tree you know like (laughs) like (laughs) now i'm now i'm just like aware that we're all on set you know what i mean like um he's wandering around capernaum all day yeah there's a similar dynamic um with regards to especially like supporting actors i think the thing that including among the apostles where you can sort of tell who, who has a sense of the character to the point where they are, they're really like, there's sort of an integration of like, like themselves in the character such that they can just kind of be, you know? Um, And then there are those who are, they're really, they're, they're taking their direction from the page and, and from the director, but they're looking at what's on the page and they're going, okay, I have to communicate this emotion somehow. 
and, and it's not really something that's kind of coming from within. It's it's more like the, it's more like it's coming from the page and passing through them to the audience. But what that ends up being is this kind of this. I mean, this is the majority of TV acting out there. But you know, when you experience a, a performance as rich as you know Jonathan Rumi's, uh, where there's there you can sense that there's more than this happening. There's an embodiment. There's a presence. Yeah. Saying there's a there's a there's a sort of a um, there's a grabbing a hold of the person of the actor himself to to really be this. Um, whereas the it's like two layers of signification almost, you know, like where yeah. the 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 day player will say someone who's you know doesn't have time to develop a whole character or whatever, or has a limited maybe skill set. You know, they can only signify one thing, which is the emotion that's that's being given them to to do. And it's never very convincing. Like it's, it's always kind of like, it's, it's always like, a, it's a layer removed from like a full experience of the reality of that emotion. It's more like, it's very clearly somebody just giving an idea of it, you know, as opposed to somebody who is really, really presencing that, you know, mm -hmm. there's like, there's like a double layer of signification there kind of where it's really become part of them. And then they're, they're kind of giving that like as an actual like work of art from their from themselves i don't know does that make sense yeah like, mm -hmm. to, to, to you guys like yeah, i think you Jonathan see that Rumi distinction that with you know with all the actors um, dude and if you want to see if you want to see like um an actor who has just an effortless presence and is able to do so much with so little um is the actor who plays herod um mm -hmm. you know we we see him for just a few moments during during that that whole sequence but it's like everything he says, everything he does, like just effortlessly commanding my attention um, and, you know, and, and, and allowing for a lot of possibilities of, 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 you know, what actually so much of my attention is because I don't really know what's going on in his head or yeah. how he's going to respond, you know? Well, to, I mean, to that point and something you said earlier, um, James, it, I think this probably also draws to a certain extent, um, as you were highlighting earlier, Nathan, on evangelical culture. And so far as in evangelical um, worship music, there does tend to be um, uh, an emphasis on telegraphing the emotion you're meant to feel. Um, right. That's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. It's also an aspect of, um, I mean, just the, the kind of need to explain things is, is also, I think, part of that. If you, you it's, it's a mm -hmm. big kind of component of, not good Christian fiction, whether it's Catholic mm -hmm. or Protestant, but I think there's more Protestant fiction out there probably. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they've kind of defined the genre in a certain way, but, um, but there's a need to kind of, there's no subtext. Everything is explained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, nothing can be, nothing can be possibly confusing because you might get the wrong idea about your salvation right, or right, right. You know, something like and that. And that mm -hmm. is the impression one gets when you see some of these interactions between characters is right. like, I want to just make it so clear that there's no confusion mm -hmm. here how these people are relating to each other in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. I, I even think a little bit of like the NIV, which I hate the NIV Bible because the NIV tries to avoid confusion and sometimes it does it. By, and well, first of all, there's like a thousand NIVs with lots of commentary in them, but um, not always the best commentary, but the, the it often tries to correct the text where it might be confusing. So, you know, that famous passage in, in Matthew where Jesus is talking about celibacy and he uses the phrase eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven gets corrected to those who, um, it, it doesn't use the word abstain, but essentially abstain from marriage, right? So they have to explain what the text says, where Jesus says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. Well, that's scientifically inaccurate. So we have to say, oh, it's a small seed. We can't have him say the smallest, which is what the Greek says where there are passages affirming the importance. There's two verses that affirm positively the importance of maintaining apostolic traditions that gets changed to teachings because we can't have Catholic or Orthodox implications come through the text. So um, there's a bit of that tendency, I think, in the show as well. Like these yes. things that might be confusing, you can't let them be ambiguous. You have to explain everything. Right. Well, and, and you see that so clearly in... Um scenes that honestly should be if they're just taken from the text as it should be home runs and for me like the the centurion uh, so gaius coming to yes. peter's house to oh beg gosh. for the healing of his of his servant you know in the show he's it's treated as he's an illegitimate child of 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 gaius um and there are aspects it's a very interesting scene to study because it there are parts of it that are immediately just straight to the heart, like very moving. Like when he falls on his knees and he's like Dominus, you know? Yeah. And, and it's just, it's, you can feel like the, whoa, like this is really, 
crossing a line here that that we don't really know what the precedent is for this with with the apostles you know you can feel the the tension and and the power of it but then every for every single moment like that it's immediately undercut by over explaining you know and to the point where it's not just what the text is saying but it's it's the, and the way the way that I, I guess i see it to again to bring back this thread of evangelical culture as the as the origin of this you know this is the kind of thing where if you're listening to this uh, scene from scripture being unpacked in a sermon, you know, you, you might get walked through by a, a good preacher will kind of walk you through the narrative slowly. Um, and then he might unpack and, and exegete as, as he does that. And obviously a good sermon will do that altogether kind of as one unit, but that's what they're trying to do yeah. in the scene mm-hmm. is like, have the characters are, are the ones providing the shading and the extra little bit of exegesis in order to make sure that we get exactly what's going on here. Whereas like, the most, imp- you know, it, it sucks the power out of it. Yeah. It diminishes it. I wouldn't say it totally takes it away, but it, it diminishes the power of um, what's actually happening, which is, you know, really can't be put into words, you know? Right. And it's frustrating because you're left feeling, at least I am, left feeling like you have to bracket a bunch of things. Like, uh, uh, okay, yeah. I just like won't think about that or I won't pay attention to this and then just stay open for when this moment comes that I know is going to come when like something hits, you start tuning certain things out. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. and that's a bummer. Um, uh, but you know, maybe someday I'll do like a super cut of like all the parts of the chosen that like work (laughs) for me. (laughs) You know, I was actually, I I had that idea a moment ago as well. (laughs) Yeah. It'd be really nice to cut together like all the best scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then just live with that, you know? So one, this is a praise and a criticism rolled into one. I don't think we've said enough about um, the character of Shmuel, mm. uh, the Pharisee. And I, I really want to, I know we're very far into the episode, but for anyone who's still listening, <laughs> who likes, you know, is maybe tired of hearing all the criticisms, um, you know, uh, I think that's, I think his arc is is probably my favorite single arc about the whole season. And it's a, it's a successful tragic arc. Mm-hmm. Um, where you really do feel that, 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 that hope of he's coming to faith and he, he, you know, he really is going to be on Jesus' side. And then of course there's that, the tragic reversal where, you know, he's offended by what he sees happening at the, in Bethany, um, when he's at table. And I don't know, I, th- I think they do handle the Schmel side of that really well. Mm-hmm. That aspect of there will be, there are souls who are, you know, as good faith as they, as they can are pursuing, but at the same time, something happens to, to set their hearts away. It's, it's deeply tragic. And it's, uh, I found that to be very, it was very upsetting to watch that, um, that watch that play out. And I think that's kind of the, the, the artistic success, the most successful artistic part of this, of this season. Um, on the flip side, <laughs> I, I, I was on not pleased with how, they used the the dinner at Bethany after the raising of Lazarus, which I think is one of the most exquisite passages in scripture. Um, so rich with so many layers of of significance, and they kind of took that uh, they took that as their setting for Shmuel to have his his fall, and they they totally the focus shifts from from Mary and Martha and Lazarus and what that moment means. Right. Um, yeah, because you also have Shmuel, Judas yeah. taking offense, and that's their opportunity to connect Judas with the Pharisees. But like, it's so distracting because you've got two guys taking offense, and everybody's missing what Mary yeah, is doing. Yeah, I mean, once which again, I guess it's is like kind that of part of the point they're making, but it's still frustrating. The crisis overrides the actual event that is highlighted in Scripture once more. Right, like that. That was which, kind of yeah. once more. Yeah, this this happens so much. Yeah. Um, right. uh, can I pose a question? Like, like just to the group. Yeah. Um, We've been going pretty hard on the show. Um, so I don't know to, you know, it's a labor of love. Um, I think we all agree that its merits are considerable. I don't know. Like how, how would you, if someone was like, Hey, you guys are just nitpicking. Like, like, can't you appreciate what's, what's happening here? Like, I don't know what, what, what's kind of the, what's your response to that? I think that like, I, I think this is the first season where the equation has kind of like flipped over to where, I'm overall frustrated with it now. Whereas even in season three, I think I was like, there was enough to kind of keep me going. I would say that from here on out, I'll be watching it out of professional obligation, except that I am genuinely interested to see how they handle the passion, 
you know, for yeah. instance, like, and there's still um, promise for the show. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not like, yeah, yeah. It could be that like there are these particular pressures, like you've been describing, Nathan, based on how they've like decided to structure the entire series that like had had caused problems for season four in particular, and like sort of left uh, left us like left the show's flaws like exposed to the naked you know the naked before the eye of Sauron you know basically um but like you know what i'm saying like the, the flaws are more apparent because of the other the strengths not being not working as well yes i yeah. think i think yes. my overall like complaints are like i found myself continually frustrated like very frequently by like so much meaningless banter that like wasn't going anywhere or wasn't necessary or just like unnecessarily drawn out melodramatic scenes that don't really tell me anything I didn't already know. And then the, the, the frustrating thing again, or the sad thing again was like, even the stuff that the show usually does well, I just found myself less excited by. And I think that's because I was often kind of like starting to feel the formula. Like there's only so many different ways you can portray a healing and like there's a lot of hugs in this show and like sometimes they're very moving but like there's only so many ways you can do it right and this right. is a seven season show so it you start to feel like it starts to feel like something you've seen before and i hate to say it and this isn't really a criticism of rumi's performance but we've always said this is the strongest part of the show i hate to say it but like even that is like working on me less yep. mm -hmm. as like i start to see like the same moves made. Well, yeah, it's like we're buddy buddy, we're having a good time, and now we're like really sincere and maybe a bit overwrought. Right. And know? so one thing I noticed with this show, with this season, was like how how often he's getting very emotional, even in even in things that could have could have been more matter of fact or could have been just more sober. Um mm -hmm. like when he's talking Reactive. to Martha about like you are concerned about many things he gets very he gets like he's like tearing up and i just don't think it could have been compassionate and like tender without being like this like almost choked up uh moment and i you know i don't know who's responsible for that jonathan rumi's an amazing actor um and it it, it pains me to say but it, it started to feel a little bit like repetitive i guess yeah um even in its best moments and so you know i don't know if there was a way that they can get out of that. I think obviously like the crucifixion changes things up enough that like, there's going to be fresh stuff. Like he just said, he's done his last major sign. Right. So like right. there's different things that are going to be happening, different types of scenes right. that we're going to see. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I just hope that like, I just hope the crucifixion, they're spending a whole season on it. Like, I hope it isn't just like, like a bunch of people freaking out and distracting us from the cro the crucifixion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, because one of the things Dallas Jenkins says is like, they're not going to try to do the same thing that the passion of the Christ did, where it was like focused on the physical brutality because they already did that so well. But here with a multi-season show, it's the relationships that have been developed and our connection to Jesus that has been developed. And so it's more emotionally devastating, mm -hmm. but I can see that overplaying that and overplaying that, that the, the, the relationships and how this affects this person, how this affects the, that person in the way, if they do that in the way that they've been handling so many of these subplots with the characters, it could just as easily like be an imposition on my emotional experience and, yeah. and something that takes me out of it. And mm -hmm. yeah. that's what I fear, especially when you say we're going to spend a whole week, a whole season on Holy Week and then a whole season on Good Friday. Um, a whole season on one day is a lot. It's a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. You know, listen, I, I do think that I've been critical of the show since season one, um, but have also praised it for a lot of the good things that it's done. Um, and I think that season four is the first one that I don't feel like I want to recommend to people, you know, mm -hmm. like I, yeah. I, I, I don't think my wife is missing anything if she doesn't watch this season, you know? Yeah. Um, I, and I, and I think that like, I, of course I don't, I, yeah, I want to give credit where credit is due. And I, I of course, don't want to be like mean spirited about any of this, but I think that you open yourself up to criticism when you start to play fast and loose with the person of Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, not that Rumi's playing fast and loose with him, but 
you do feel like the show is beginning to play a little fast and loose with him and that it's becoming more culpable, you know, like, yeah. right. uh, obvi- I think originally it was only the jokes that made me feel they were. Yeah. Well, and that, that is to be, be fair. I think that's one of the few things they've actually improved, at least from like the season two low point of like the too soon jokes and these things, yeah, like, because yeah. we didn't get that kind of constant interruption of serious moments by a gag. Like that's well, gone. Now. I mean, it, but we did get a little bit of like, uh, like, uh, if it wasn't an interruption, it was often like a a okay. Now we can put a put a punctuation point on that. Like this yeah, because yeah. with the raising of Lazarus, I was like, oh great, there doesn't seem like they're gonna do a joke. And then finally, they got you know they got to it. And <laughs> I don't know. It's maybe it's not so much like gags now as mm. it is just kind of like now we're gonna let our hair down and banter kind right, of thing. Right. It's, yeah. it's yeah. not like a stupid like punchy too soon necessarily, yeah, yeah. but. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, it's because the the series is getting more dark and serious, and so I think that helped them to steer away from some of the jokes. Yeah, um, there there is one but, flaw yeah. I wanted to just mention that I don't think they can really recover from at this point, just because the chronology is sort of messed up. I mean, once you've kind of put it up up there, you, you can't reverse it, and it's it's merely everyone's understanding of who Jesus is, in the Gospels. Um, well, I mean, John's a bit different here. In John, you get um, uh, some of the apostles that Jesus is calling recognize him as the Messiah right away. Um, but the crescendo in John is we move from a recognition that he's the Messiah to Thomas's confession after the resurrection that Jesus is his Lord and his God, right? That's like a high point. In the Synoptic Gospels, you get um, a slower progression where people recognize Jesus as maybe the Messiah, but definitely the great prophet that Moses promised, right? He's the new Moses. Uh, This is promised in the book of Deuteronomy by Moses himself. Um, And Jesus, that's like the one title that he's willing to publicly affirm. Yes, you know, I am that person. Um, And then we eventually get in like uh, Matthew and Mark, uh, St. Peter's confession that he is the Christ. And that's, that is a high point there. Um, and Jesus is teasing in many ways that he is divine. That's that's there. But the, the whole point is nobody gets it. Nobody gets it that whole time. They don't even get that he said he's going to die. Um, right. And that's so like that's so obscure for them. And things like Jesus kind of pointing to now you could presume maybe he explained to Lazarus about Isaiah's prophecy. But in in their minds at the time, Isaiah's prophesying about the suffering servant has nothing to do with the Messiah. These are completely separate prophecies. Um, and that, that's part of the whole point is that Jesus's coming was so baffling because all of these things that were predicted about him would have seemed until Jesus puts them together on the, in, for instance, in the Emmaus road story, where he explains everything in the scriptures that is about him in the Psalms, it says, and in the, uh, in the law, um, to the apostles until he gives them the interpretation they don't understand that the suffering servant and all these other things are all about him um you know there's there's the prophecy of the son of man in the book of daniel there's the suffering servant in isaiah there's explicit prophecies that were understood as being messianic in the psalms and elsewhere um there's the great prophet jesus puts all of those things together in himself but that's part of the point is this was meant to be mysterious so that the powers of darkness wouldn't understand it because otherwise they wouldn't have cooperated in the plan uh, of, of man's salvation. That's completely like in the show you have I, in this season, I forget who even does it, but someone confesses Jesus as God. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, yeah. the, you, you are not going to get that crescendo that you would have gotten right. from Thomas saying that later on, because it's already happened and it's happened right, in Josh, a way that yeah, you wasn't. mentioned that you, you mentioned this in a previous episode too. I, it might've even been like season two or something. I, I remember you saying, yeah, it seems a little soon, uh, for yeah. this confession to happen. Yeah. Do you guys think, Joseph, this is a short question, Joseph, is, it's Joseph of Arimathea. Right? I believe he is. Like the, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's, right. that's obvious, right? Yeah. Oh, really? Um, Yusuf? That's what I assume. I assume yeah. that's, oh, yeah. I, also, okay. I'm dying yeah. for Nicodemus to come back because I th- always thought that was one of the most Me interesting too. characters. And I'm so yeah, tired I of him being like back. ill or whatever it is that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so first, somebody said he was on like a research trip and then somebody said he was ill. Yeah, so. I don't know if like the actor just doesn't want to come back or what's going on, but I want that payoff. 
The the one who plays Quintus is like this big anime voiceover actor. Really? He's Which he's been in like a, a ton of, of anime. Huh. He, yeah, he looks per- like an anime character. <laughs> he does. He acts like one, too. Yeah, his vo- like that his whole, voice sounds like an whole, anime like, voice actor. That whole se- oh, sequence man. when he got really angry and just, like, left his office and just started, like, terrorizing the streets of, of uh, Capernaum. You know, this was totally channeling, like, anime rage. That makes so much yeah. sense. Yeah, <laughs> that makes so it much really sense. Does. Yeah. I'm really glad does. you mentioned that, because honestly, he's he, his... Nothing against the actor. I think he did his best, but that whole conception of that character and that dynamic really drove me crazy the entire show yeah really. yeah I, well I now agree. now you just have to go watch so, it back and just imagine everything as as an anime you you just close your eyes and just see like anime quintus like like the bulging like the <laughs> lines on his forehead that, uh, the sword the, the sword's veins. going <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> this is what happens when you talk about the chosen for three hours yeah I really think season five, I think we have a lot of good things to expect from it because with the tighter structure, I think I think it will play entirely to Jenkins' strengths as a director, mm-hmm. the cast strength. I think I think we have every reason to think that it's gonna be a lot better and that four is gonna be more of an anomaly. That's that's my gut feeling. I yeah. hope you're right. Yeah. I think that's probably true. And they're not gonna invent a new romance for Holy Week, I I hope. <laughs> yeah, very right. right. <laughs> Brother Joshua, thank you so much for being our recurring The Chosen correspondent, as always. Sure. It's a delight to talk to you. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure. Glad to see you all again and glad to be back and glad to have met you, Nathan. Virtually, anyway. Likewise. <laughs> yeah, Nathan, thanks, as always, as as well. And uh, yeah, so it'll be a okay. while. Uh, we were late on this one because, you know, the, the season came out in theaters and then because the the dispute with Angel Studios, they weren't able to stream it for quite a while longer. So uh, but yeah, we'll probably be on a get to the next ones quicker, I suppose, after it comes out. Uh, but um, all right, everybody, thanks for listening. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if you um, if you're done listening, then stop and we'll see you next time. <laughs> I was going to try to, like, get them to do something, but I just like whatever they've done. <laughs> they've done enough. Criteria is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Catholic Culture audiobooks bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical resources, and much more at CatholicCulture.org. <laughs>